Sergeants, if you could please begin your recording. PC recording is underway. Chambers recording is started. Todd recording is up. Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Small Business. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices and if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that address is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Thank you for joining our hearing today before the Council's Committee on Small Business. I will be chairing this hearing in person today. First, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are present in the chambers with me, Council Member Rosenthal, Council Member Dinowitz, and via Zoom, Council Member Moya. Good morning. I'm Council Member Mark Joan. I chair of the Committee on Small Business, and I'd like to welcome you to our hearing on four bills. Intros 2333, 2335, 2356, and 2359, which seek to accelerate the recovery of the restaurant industry and ensure restaurants can succeed and survive in this post-COVID marketplace. Even before the pandemic, owning and operating a restaurant in a city was challenging. 80% of restaurants typically go out of business within the first five years of opening. Between rent, labor, and inventory costs, government regulations, and steep competition, operating a restaurant at profit can be extremely challenging. And yet, tens of thousands of New Yorkers still choose this industry. Perhaps they felt their culture's cuisine was not represented in their neighborhoods or because they wanted to share their love of the food with their communities. And New Yorkers have supported this entrepreneurial spirit by patronizing these restaurants. The pandemic, and the resulting restrictions on in-person dining, while certainly necessary for public health, dealt a devastating blow to restaurant owners. Restaurants were forced to survive on depleted revenues and third-party platforms, which had previously accounted for a small percentage of orders, were suddenly the lifeline for many restaurants. To ensure restaurants could survive throughout the pandemic, this committee passed local laws 51 and 52 of 2020, which prevented platforms for erroneously charging restaurants for phone orders that did not occur and capped the fees that the platforms could charge restaurants. The committee extended both of these laws through the passage of local law 87 and 88. As the city has reopened and the dark days of the pandemic are hopefully behind us, the restaurant industry will begin to recover. Certain customers and consumer habits have remained. That will make it more difficult for restaurants to succeed, mainly consumers who become accustomed to ordering on third-party platforms that charge a substantial fee per order for the marketing and delivery service they provide, may continue to use these platforms. According to Scott Duke uh, Cominers, a professor at Harvard Business School, And the quote is, people have gotten much more used to ordering food and other products to delivery services. Some of that will decline once it's safe to do things in person, of course, but new habit formation is powerful, end quote. The rise of third-party platforms is also apparent from their corporate strategies. Uber acquired delivery service Postmates in November 2020 and in December 2020, DoorDash made its public market debut. DoorDash stock rose 86% during its initial public offering, one of the biggest IPOs of 2020 at a time when over 110,000 restaurants were closing across the country, including over 5,000 in New York City. The platforms were experiencing a dramatic increase in business while the restaurants were seeing a depletion of their business. 
This committee has conducted three oversight hearings this legislative session on the rise of third-party delivery platforms in the city. During these hearings, small businesses and advocates have highlighted issues with these platforms, including listing restaurants on their platforms without permission, high commission fees, and the use of app-generated phone numbers to charge a commission and at times charge a commission for an order that did not take place. As President Biden has said, we must build back better. The package of bills we're hearing today will ensure that restaurants have the tools that they need to succeed and survive the post-COVID world. I look forward to hearing feedback from the delivery platforms, restaurants, business advocacy groups, and restaurant owners on the impact of this legislation and how the bills can be best tailored to achieve their aims. I look forward to having a conversation with the administration as well as to hear about their experience enforcing local laws 87 and 88 of 2020 and any changes to the bills they would recommend for that experience. As chair of the committee, it has been my top priority to ensure that small businesses, micro businesses, mom and pop shops remain the backbone of the city's economy from suspending personal guarantees on small business leases to cutting government fines on rules and regulations it's been an honor to serve the hardworking small business owners of this city. With that said, I wanna thank my chief of staff, Reggie Johnson, our legislative counsel, Stephanie Jones, policy analyst, Noah Meixler, and financial analyst, Aliyah Ali, for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Before I turn it over to Council Moya to deliver an opening statement, I just wanna, express the importance of this hearing and why these hearings are so important as we determine what needs to be done to protect small businesses, consumers, and industries. The impacts of intro 2333, 2335, 2356, and 2359 now have enough data for us to understand their impact and perhaps unintended consequences. We need to learn from this administration about the difficulties that they have experienced in enforcing local laws 87 and 88 and concerns that they have about these bills as we move forward while hearing from all of the stakeholders. I'm a pro business council member and I believe in free markets. And I believe that government's responsibility is not to pick winners and losers, but I do believe that government has a role in protecting its consumers and citizens and taxpayers. And with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to Council Moya, who has a statement to deliver. Thank you, Chair Jonai. Um, thank you for uh, all that you've done uh, throughout this pandemic and throughout the years uh, to really uh, help and protect our small businesses uh, when they needed it the most. Uh, and I thank you for that as well. Um, I'm Councilmember Francisco Moya. Thank you again, uh, Chair, for having me. Uh, mom and pop shops make each neighborhood unique and they employ locally and drive our local economy. When the pandemic hit, and if you were operating in a neighborhood disproportionately impacted by COVID, these businesses took a hit. And if you didn't have the resources to pivot to a digital food delivery service model, the loss of business was greater. Now add that to having to pay exorbitant fees to third party food delivery services while trying to keep staff employed and covering expenses uh, all the while managing the loss of business. Uh, for far too long, these third party food delivery services knowingly and willingly took advantage of small businesses and the pandemic highlighted this abuse. As one of the greatest cities in the world, we need to stand by our small business owners every single day. We cannot allow these companies to choose their profit margins over those of mom and pop shops and especially struggling businesses by charging them fees for services they may not even be providing. As our small businesses begin to recover, we must prevent abuse like this from happening again. These companies from the onset had the opportunity to do what's right, so here's their chance. We need to do everything we can to protect our mom and pop shops, the workers they employ, and our local economy. Uh, for these companies, it's just another restaurant. But for us, uh, in our neighborhoods, these restaurants are an integral part of the character of our community. And that's why I, I introduced intro 2359 to make these caps permanent. I will always stand by my small business owners over billionaire owned companies 
any given day of the week. Uh, and with that, I want to turn it back over to our chair and thank you uh, again for allowing me to. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Council Member, and uh, I want to thank you for the time and the hard work that you've put in uh, to this uh, hearing and all along during the pandemic to protect our small businesses and your friendship and commitment to our small businesses is something that uh, I'm proud of. And with that, I want to uh, now turn it over um, to um, our moderator, uh, Committee Council Stephanie Jones to go over some procedural items over Zoom. For those of you present here in person, the Zoom feed that we broadcast footage of our committee council and any witnesses testifying over Zoom will be displayed on the television set up for us in the city hall chambers. Thank you, Chair Joni. I am Stephanie Jones, Council to the Committee on Small Business, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind Zoom participants that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I will be calling on panelists to testify one by one. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelist will be. At this hearing, we will first be inviting testimony from the Office of Special Enforcement and then from members of the public. During the hearing, council members who would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist will be called upon by the chair to do so. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. For all panelists, when called in to testify, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any. We will now call representatives of the administration to testify. We will be hearing testimony from Christian Klossner, Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement. We will also be joined for questions by Stephen Atanani, Executive Director of External Affairs for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. At this time, I will administer the affirmation to administration panelists. Executive Director Klossner and Executive Director Atanani, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Executive Director Atanani? I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Executive Director Klossner to present his testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Joni and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Christian Klosner, and I am the Executive Director of the Office of Special Enforcement, also known as OSE, which is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. I am also joined by my colleague, Stephen Edanani, Executive Director of External Affairs for the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection, or DCWP. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. OSE's mandate, originating from a mayoral executive order in 2006 is to coordinate efforts across city agencies to problem solve around emerging issues adversely affecting neighborhood cohesion, livability, and safety. OSE has served this function in numerous issue areas with the vast majority of this work over the past several years focused on preventing the housing loss and community disruption caused by illegal short-term rentals. Since the emergence of COVID-19, OSE has engaged in new work streams related to the pandemic including pursuant to a designation from the Corporation Council, taking a lead in investigating industry compliance with at first local laws 51 and 52, later local laws 87 and 88, which prohibit delivery apps from charging restaurants for phone calls that do not result in transactions and, and imposing caps on certain delivery application fees during and for 90 days after the pandemic. When the laws were first passed, the enforcement challenges were clear. We considered how could we move quickly to enforce a law, ensure industry-wide compliance, and do so without placing a heavy time burden on struggling restaurateurs to gather, detect, and report every possible violation, and then participate in extensive investigation and prosecution of overcharges on a one-by-one -one basis. We also considered how we could do all that with existing resources. OSC is pleased to have piloted a successful enforcement model that resulted in broad 
broad spread compliance with the law. Instead of taking a complaint by complaint approach that could have entailed bringing multiple actions against the same several companies, OSC established a sort of early warning system by which it would learn about potential violations and then use those reports of a singular occurrence that appeared to violate the law to confront the company and ensure that the issues were addressed comprehensively to the benefit of all the users of that company's service and not just the one that gave us the report. I wanna take a moment to thank those restaurateurs who notified OSC of practices that potentially violated the law. Um, and in particular, I see that several of them are here today and I look forward to hearing what they have to report now. Their reports and the effort they took to prepare them allow OSC to identify and resolve compliance issues, as well as develop a sense of the limitations of the law and to understand some of the perhaps unintended consequences of these laws. I look forward to hearing from them during this hearing and others about these new proposals and the need for a permanent cap. It should also be noted that the companies themselves chose to take compliance seriously. Often new laws are challenged by industry lawsuits seeking to invalidate the regulations. When it came to these laws, the companies apparently chose to forego legal challenge of the laws and instead accepted the temporary, temporary restrictions for the duration of the pandemic. I also want to thank the sponsors and the council for providing tools beyond the traditional enforcement rubric of complaint investigation violation and civil penalty. OSC believes that including restitution as a potential remedy not only created an option for making restaurateurs whole, but eliminated the financial incentive for companies who may have otherwise chosen not to comply. <clears throat> Including an option to seek injunctive relief meant that we could seek a court order forcing a company to comply across the board instead of hoping that fines for non-compliance would be sufficient deterrence. And allowing an action to be brought in any court of competent jurisdiction for the full range of remedies sent the message that enforcement actions could be brought swiftly and comprehensively and not get bogged down in multiple actions against the same party that would resolve one instance at a time over months. It was your partnership in providing this set of flexible enforcement options that the administration requested that made possible the level of compliance we observed and produced. OSC testified at the last hearing in August that the administration supports passage of legislation ensuring the provisions added by local laws 51 and 52 remain in effect until restaurants are allowed to open fully. At a time where the declared health emergency forced most restaurants to pivot to a delivery only or delivery mostly op operation, it was critical to step in and ensure that restaurants would not be forced to operate at a loss while delivery services delivery service companies reaped a windfall with a surge in deliveries. Put another way, the pandemic forced restaurants to use services that may have otherwise never, ex they, excuse me, the pandemic forced restaurants to use services that they may have otherwise never accepted the rates or terms of simply so they could keep their lights on and their staff employed. As the city reopens, Restaurants are leading the way in the recovery of the New York job market. According to my colleagues at the Department of Small Business Services, restaurants added 15,000 jobs in April, and the city's full service restaurants now have three times as many employees in April of this year as they had in April of 2020, their lowest point. Even with these very positive indicators, tourism and foot traffic are still catching up with below pre-pandemic norms and restaurants still need our support to recover from a devastating year. Now that we are no longer subject to the emergency declarations and restaurants are no longer prohibited from maximum occupancy and the clock is winding down on local laws 87 and 88, OSC appears today to report that the administration continues to support ensuring that local businesses are not subject to predatory actions by companies that interject themselves between a business and its patrons, while also supporting those same local businesses' ability to determine for themselves, free from artificial bargaining disparities, what services they are or are not willing to pay for. Introductions 2356 and 2359 would make the provisions of local laws 51 and 52 and 87 and 88 permanent. Introduction 2333 
prohibits third-party delivery apps from arranging deliveries from a restaurant or listing the restaurant on the app without a written agreement between the app and the restaurant to provide delivery services. Introduction 2335 requires third-party delivery apps to disclose a restaurant's direct phone number with a description of the phone number and any fees associated with calling the number. If the app also includes an additional phone number as part of the listing, the app must include a description of the additional phone number. Oh, I apologize. The administration stands ready to work with council on these proposals to ensure that they have dedicated resources and staff and are well tailored to prevent predatory behavior and include flexible enforcement alternatives. In particular, OSE encourages a close review of the bill's provisions and definitions. Specifically, the definition of third-party delivery service could prove problematic in the long term. A company could easily abandon its delivery options and then be free to charge whatever it could get a restaurant to agree for, for advertising and promotion. Similarly, a company could provide a range of helpful services, but by also offering delivery, be financially prevented from offering the other valuable services. Or a third situation could be two companies that provide advertising and discount credit card processing rates, but only one of those two offers delivery. Only the company that includes delivery would fall under the limits of the law. We are looking forward to hearing from the many restaurateurs and other businesses who make these kinds of business decisions that are currently imp impacted by the existing laws and who will be most affected by the bill proposals. We are committed to working with the council to ensure the final bills reflect the policies that will protect restaurants from predatory behavior while retaining the business options that businesses choose for themselves. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide testimony and I welcome any questions you have. Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Joni. Administration panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Joni, you may begin your questions. Thank you. And I want to also acknowledge that we have uh, Rachel Cordero with us, Deputy Director for Government Affairs, and how instrumental she's been in preparation for this hearing. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I want to thank you for that explanation. Can you help explain the process for enforcing the requirements of Local Law 8788 from the point at which you receive a complaint to the point at which a complaint is resolved? And the number of agents or officers that you have working on receiving the complaints and then actually following through with the complaint? Sure. I, I mean, I think I was, uh, in my testimony, I referenced an early warning system. I, I want to be very clear. We did not set up a complaint inspection resolution system. What we set up was an early warning system where businesses that believed that they were uh, being charged inappropriately could report that and that we would then take that and approach the companies. We would obviously investigate it, look at it, see whether it, the law applied and not, and not in every case did it apply. Um, and then we would reach out to the companies and say, we've identified a problem. What is going on? Here's what we expect from you to fix it. Um, our goal in doing that was to get restitution whenever possible for the restaurants and to be able to have the benefits of the one complaint inure to all of the similarly situated restaurants throughout the city. Um, as to the number of staff, we did this within existing resources. Um, we, I would say, approximately four to five OSE staff members worked on this with some portion of their time. Um, and I, I think that answers the question, but I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Chair, to, to do it. And I, and I do wanna say also, I, I wanna thank your staff for putting the hearing together. Uh, it was seamless getting in this morning. Thank you. Um, for the four or five OSC staff, what were the number of complaints that were received um, in reference to local law 87 and 88? Um, I, again, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna reject complaint because many of the contacts that we received were actually more in the status of an inquiry um, asking whether the law applied to us. Um, the, we received approximately 22 such contacts from 15 different individuals. You received 22 
um, questions. Is that what you're saying? Um, from 15? Uh, I'd say 22 contacts, some of which were questions like, hey, this company raised their rates on me to meet the limits of the fees. Can they do that? Um, right, that answer is yes, they can. Um, we received an inquiry saying they're charging me 10% for a pickup. Can they do that? The answer is no. And then we launch an investigation and we start, we start dealing with the company and pursuing restitution. Using that uh, question or contact, how many of the 22 were involved, involved pricing and the charges or the fees that they were paying to a third party delivery app? Um, I, I'd have to get back to you in the specific breakdown. Uh, the majority, um, the, the issue that received the majority of inquiries were certainly related to overcharging. Um, some of those inquiries were, um, you know, concerns about overcharging that turned out to be, um, you know, more about how the charges were described than whether or not they actually exceeded. Um, but that was the majority issue. So, Mr. Klausner, did you receive any question or concern or a contact regarding a fee that should not have been charged according to the local laws that we had passed and that were found that they were unjustified? Uh, yes. The, uh, there, uh, well, that was a two-part question. Sorry, I answered yes to your first part. Um, about uh, which was, were there complaints about fees that were unjustified? Uh, in, in the last appearance before this committee, I, um, I described two specific circumstances um, that were potentially violative. Um, one, um, one set of inquiries related to the situation I just mentioned where um, a company was apparently charging 10% for pickup orders when the limit would be 5% if there wasn't a delivery. Um, we found, uh, we went to the company, we found that that was happening. Um, that company provided restitution, uh, did, a, did a comprehensive review, um, corrected the issue and issued refunds to the restaurants. Um, uh, the other instance that I reported to the council at the last hearing um, was that uh, restaurant owners were concerned that the credit card processing fees were being, um, that credit card processing fees were not covered by the 5% cap and they were being charged. Um, when local laws 51 and 52 became local laws 87 and 88, um, the credit card processing fees were specifically exempted and that ended that review. Um, and then in the, in the last hearing, um, we had reported that we had not heard any concerns about charges for calls um, and then one of the with, um, one of the public witnesses then later testified in that hearing that they believed that they had been charged um, for those calls. Um, we did investigate that. Um, we took that back to the company, um, and I and, and we think that um, you know we, we think that the company has made very significant efforts to comply with the with the law. Um, our review of that of that matter is continues to be ongoing. Um, but it does raise significant concerns um, that I, I want to put before the council about um, extending that bill. Uh, and I think that these concerns also touch on uh, intro 2335. Um, I apologize, I may have just said the wrong number. Um, no, 2335, that's right. Um, and, and, and that's this, and I, you know, I, I will give my view and I, I, look forward to, um, I look forward to the council probing this issue with any of the companies that testify so we can get even greater clarity um, as well as um, what the restaurants have to say about this. Um, the reality is a restaurant is not just paying for the order uh, when they pay by each call, right? They may also, depending on the company they're interacting with, be paying for a suite of business tools that are used to track, receive, record, store message, store phone calls, and to review and manage the calls and orders. Making this provision permanent in its current format raises 
a concern uh, in that there's a possibility it would force the company to suspend support for some of those tools. Um, I, I think that it's particularly um, important that business owners maintain access to these tools. These are the very same tools that they were using to do their own investigations of charges to be able to report and provide documentation to us. Um, we would also be concerned if, um, if these were made permanent that, uh, that the delivery app companies would change their pricing model in such a way that the charges would be shifted to all users, regardless of whether their phone is ringing instead of only those users whose phones are ringing based on the services provided by the companies. Um, as I said before, I, you know, I, I, hope that, I hope that that's clear and I hope that this provides the committee um, with a line of questionings for the industry that testifies today. And, and I welcome the insight of the business owners who use these tools um, and, and who can speak to the value. Thank you, Mr. Klasner. But I, I'm trying to get a better understanding of how OSC received and what uh, complaints or concerns were brought to their attention and then the follow-up with those third-party uh, delivery apps. Uh, on, the in, on the point that you brought up about phone charge order from the complaint that was brought up at our own hearing, was it validated that there, it was an inappropriate charge after you investigated it? Um, it did appear to be an inappropriate charge. And when you brought it to the attention of the third party delivery platform, what was their response? Um, their response is part of an ongoing investigation that involves exchange of confidential information and that I'm not going to talk about before this committee hearing today in a, in a public way um, because it's ongoing. But because it's I, I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to perhaps uh, meet privately with council staff to discuss this, um, but you know, the information sharing was between the company and ourselves was often subject to confidentiality orders and protective orders. Um, and so we really need to be very careful to protect the integrity um, and the ongoing cooperation of the company, frankly, with the investigation. Mr. Klausner, I thank you for that, but this is a transparent hearing and the public is watching. I'm not asking you for the name of the restaurant operator or the third party food delivery app itself but you obviously found an erroneous charge that was in violation of our local law 8788. When you brought it to the attention of that provider um, and you're investigating or they're investigating and it sounds like they're trying to take corrective measures. Um, what I'm trying to find out, is this a widespread problem? Did they identify this as a single incident? Are you looking into how many other incidents there could be that perhaps were not brought to OSE? Yeah, I mean, uh, let, me, let me try to give a little more detail um, and, and forgive me for speaking slowly. I just, I, I wanna tread carefully um, in order to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn about the matter that continues to be under investigation. Um, the, I think, you know, as I mentioned, um, the tools that are used, right? And I think that the person who reported this in the hearing um, in their testimony said that because they had some free time, they started going back and listening to calls to see if they returned to the order. Uh, the reality is neither, neither the city, the restaurants, nor the companies can afford to listen to every single phone call to determine. This is a very, very challenging law to implement for the industries. It's a very challenging law for businesses to monitor. It's a very challenging law for the city to enforce. Um, our, the understanding that we gained, that we believe to be universal across companies is that there are various indicators that they use to screen out calls that are unlikely to have reported in an order. Um, so one example would be if a call is five seconds long, Right. And then the company would say, we're not going to um, we're not going to charge for that because there's no way it resulted in an order. Um, I do not think that um, that it can be done foolproof, but I do believe that the industries took very significant steps, both in the implementation of the law to prevent any charges from occurring as well as after our inquiry to continue to refine and adjust their algorithms to make sure that even more calls um, were screened out. 
But Mr. Klausner, is the law then foolproof? Is it protecting our restaurant industry? I, I, I don't think it's foolproof. I think it was an important measure during the emergency um, in order to protect consumers. I, I think this is an issue. And, and again, I, I really am looking forward to hearing what witnesses come after me have to say in the matter and continuing to engage with counsel on this to make sure that they're protected in the best way possible. Um, but as I said, this is a very challenging law and, it's, and it has the potential for a number of unintended consequences in terms of simply the industry changing the way they bill or changing the amount of services they provide, which we know that they did, right? We know that they stopped allowing premium sponsored content ads. Um, and as a result, businesses that wanted to pay more than the, than the fee limits in order to launch a business or to get premium placement, were not allowed to, right? I mean, it's those kinds of unintended consequences that we really need to work through. And we need to hear from the companies here today um, on what efforts they took uh, to comply with the law, as well as their view on, on how their compliance is. Mr. Klausner, I, I'm, I apologize for being so persistent, but it sounds more like I'm a dentist not trying to pull out a tooth. If you, and this is, I believe, several months ago that this uh, was brought to your attention, correct? At our hearing, do you remember the date? I don't remember the date. I believe, I believe August, but I'm guessing on memory. So we're looking at August and now we're into July. That's more than eight months later. And you still haven't, if, you, if there was a violation, I believe the local law is clear. <laughs> says if you see a violation, you brought it to your attention a provider, and if, he, and if it was confirmed a violation, shouldn't there have been a violation issued? No. No? I, I think the law clearly provides that as an option, but as I testified before, the challenge to doing this was how can we enforce this law right away, right? When these laws passed, we didn't know it would be a year. We didn't want to wait for an extensive regulatory promulgation of rules, setting up a full complaint line through 311, et cetera. We set up an immediate pre-effective date early warning system where business owners committed to us to report any problems that they saw. And we took each complaint that had validity directly to the companies and produced compliance on behalf of all restaurants. So I understand that you have a strong preference for a complaint and violation. And I am here as the administration's enforcement expert to say that is not the most efficient or effective way to do the, this kind of enforcement, nor would it have been the kind of lightning fast enforcement that we did set up. I, I look, this to me is uh, something uh, unorthodox because in the city of New York, we love to find um, our business owners and anyone that's in violation, and we leave it to the interpretation of the court system thereafter. What you're telling, I'm going to read this law, and uh, if I'm wrong here, please let me know. Um, Local 87 2020 is amended as follows Telephone orders, no third party food delivery service may charge any fee for a food service establishment for a telephone order if a telephone call between such establishment and a customer does not result in an actual transaction during the telephone call. The requirement of the section applies only during a period in which a state disaster emergency has been declared by the governor of the state of New York or state emergency has been declared by the mayor. Such declaration is in effect in a city of food service establishment in the city prohibited from operating at the maximum indoor capacity for a period of 90 days. There is no fine associated with this violation. Is that my interpretation? I, 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 I'm sorry. You were reading the law and then you said there's no fine associated with it and you're asking me about asking your you. interpretation? I'm asking you the interpretation of this, of section 2847 of the Administrative Code of New York as amended by number 87 of 2020. Because if there's a violation or fee imposed for violation or for non-compliance, then why do we even have this local law? The, the fines, and I, and I hear what you're saying, right? There, there is a traditional view of how to do enforcement in the city. And that's you take a complaint through 311, you send an inspector, 
the inspector makes a finding, it goes to oath and a violation is imposed, right? I understand that that is the normal way. And in many situations, that is the best way, right? If you have a set of actors such as building owners, right? We, most of our work is um, under the building code. There are hundreds of thousands of buildings, right? And there's um, a, sub, a smaller number than that of owners. They're all acting independently, right? You can't take them on all at once as a class. This is an instance where there are only a handful of companies that are providing the same service to people all across the city. If there was, if the city had one landlord for all all people, it's the cluster. Then I'm so you sorry. wouldn't want to comp- I, I I come from real estate, so unless there was a complaint file that was brought the attention to the attention of a department or an agency, there wouldn't be a inspector that's sent out. And routinely, inspectors go out and just travel the districts and neighborhoods of the city, and if they see something, they follow up. In this case, there was an actual complaint brought to your attention. You confirmed that there was an illegal charge. I'm asking eight months later, you're telling me it's still under review. Why wasn't there a violation issued? What more did we do to see if this was widespread? Yes, I, and I've explained, and, I, and I've explained, and I'll explain again, and I don't mind your persistence. That is why we're here. Um, and I, I'll try to make myself clearer than I have been so far. We did not set up a violation system. That would have taken resources we were not provided. It would have taken time that New York City restaurants didn't have. And it would have placed a significant amount of burden on restaurants to do the work themselves. And I'm not gonna back down from that decision. That was the right decision. We wanted to protect our restaurants as fast as possible. It's a decision that council was aware of before they passed the bills. And it's a decision that I stand by. And as a result of that decision, What we did was we immediately protected restaurants. We made sure that these businesses were complying with the fee caps. We contacted them before the law went into effect and we said, this is going on. We expect compliance. If there's not compliance, you can expect to pay fines, restitution and attorney's fees, right? What I don't, what I'm not gonna do with one of six companies that's violating across dozens and dozens of users is go to oath dozens and dozens of times on every single undercharge. That's an incredible, incredible inefficiency. It puts burdens on the restaurants. And frankly, it it serves to the advantage of the major company that can go and fight these individual instances out. It's much better to to work with them, get compliance, get restitution where need be. And if it requires a lawsuit, to bring one lawsuit alleging all the violations. It's one violation for one infraction And what you're telling me is there is no teeth. You chose- I didn't say that. No, I didn't say that. In fact, I thanked the council for its partnership in ensuring that these laws had real teeth in giving us options other than the traditional complaint investigation and violation. And council member, you're clearly trying to get me to say something that you're trying to say. We may not agree on this. I'd be happy to continue this dialogue, Um, but I'm I'm here to explain what we did and why. um, And I'm, I'm happy to keep explaining. Um, I come from real estate and I'm very familiar on how you operate and what it means to issue a violation when there's a complaint and how it's followed up and no real estate property owner gets that break. We don't get a notice. Say, Hey, do you realize that your sidewalk is cracked? It comes with an immediate violation and imposed penalty for not maintaining so I asked you in your follow up to company, you said they made restitution to the restaurant. If I was in the business, well, then I would be doing that all day long because there would be no fear of penalty. And if I get caught, worst case scenarios, I have to refund the business that I erroneously charged for an order that I shouldn't have. So that's what I'm implying here. You're not saying. No, I, fine. Then I'll, I'll, I will be more plain then. It would not have served anyone's interests, the governments or the restaurants, to have brought an action for a $1,000 fine against a company that was cooperating with the investigation and making changes. That would have been a misuse of public funds and it would have provided no additional benefit to any of the restaurants. 
That's going to be music to the ears of the real estate industry because I'm going to use this in their defense from now on. Don't Sir, I encourage you not to. The, the reason that the funds, thing that OSC bought to investigate a violation is- that we have on the books that we just passed in the middle of pandemic under the umbrella of covering and protecting restaurants, which is just really helping the third party food delivery app. But I'll leave that to later on, and we're going to continue this conversation. And if I don't mind, I'll ask another question. Do you? Well, think- I would like to respond, sir, because you're you're deciding your familiarity and, and comparing this to other contexts that are not appropriate. What I'm trying to say is that the Office of Special Enforcement exists to be innovative and nimble, and to look at new situations and develop the most effective and efficient enforcement schemes we can find. The fact that it's different from existing systems doesn't mean it's wrong. It seems like you have a number of concerns about the traditional systems of inspection and fines, uh, but then you're criticizing OSC for not applying those things that you don't agree with in this context. I think instead we came up with an immediately implementable system that produced broad spec compliance. I think you're going to hear that from the people who speak after us. And, uh, and with that, I'm, I'm happy to move to another topic. We will... We, are, we will absolutely continue this conversation, and it's called unilaterally I look forward to it. of the same laws, unilaterally by across the board of any industry. There should be no double standard or a separate standard for any industry or any provider or any entity. A law is a law, and it should be unilaterally applied in the same fashion. That's my point. And in this case, you've confirmed there was a violation and there was no penalty imposed. And if that's the position, I think many property owners would be pleased to hear that that is how this administration is now moving forward. If you're- Well, they shouldn't hear that. And don't put those words in my mouth, please, because that is not the message. The message is that in this instance, where we had 99.9% compliance and had the cooperation and adjustment of companies, 99.9 is a made up number, please don't hold me to that, that while we have widespread compliance on a law that just took effect, right? You're also talking about laws that have been on the books for years and years and years and that are known obligations to building owners through the city. But we're not here today to talk about building policy. We're here to talk about the enforcement policy and how to protect restaurants by making sure that across the board, they are protected from these companies, that they that the costs of enforcement are not put on to them to detect and report, uh, but they can be dealt with across the board in a single instance. And that can be done with the, the minimal amount of resources so that other resources are available to support businesses in ways that can benefit them directly instead of imposing fines that the restaurants don't see any benefit from. Thank you, Mr. Klausner. And I, I don't wanna, con- I'm sure you wanna move on also, but your point of one infraction, on the way over from the borough of the Bronx, I drove through many stoplights. I obeyed all of them. If I would have hit one red light, I expect to hit, hit, hit with a violation. But that's the point I'm making. The point I'm making. Do you think the penalty schemes of these bills are effective and why not? And do you think any other enforcement tools that you would recommend, including in the bills? Um, well, I very, you know, again, I very much want to... Um, and I'm I'm only re- I'm only uh, excited to move on because as I've said before I, I really I think that the best value that we're going to get at the end of this hearing is understanding how the business owners view this and how the companies uh, respond to it. Um, I, I I don't mind the the back and forth and I'm happy to put that on hold and do privately if if uh, need be. Um, the fines again I th- I think the tools that are the most important are the ability to seek injunctive relief and the ability to get restitution. I think fines and the traditional model of imposing a fine allow for a business to not comply and assume a cost of doing business. Um, I don't think we want that. What we want is a law that was designed and and that is the value that these laws had where there's a range of remedies so that the enforcement entity has the option of choosing what is the most efficient and effective way to get broad scale compliance um, regardless of the tool. Um, you know, there are obviously, there, you know, you always want to make sure that the penalty is tied to the violation. 
Um, you know, a thousand dollar fine for a thousand dollars of overcharges is one thing, a thousand dollar fine for 10 cents of overcharges is another. But I, I think that the important thing about this is not the fine amount, but the range of remedies. The, the continued inclusion of restitution is a remedy that says to restaurants, you're going to pay all this back. So don't bother, right? That promotes a lot of upfront compliance, which is the goal we, of all laws. We want compliance because it's the law. The inclusion of bringing an action in a court of competent jurisdiction for all the remedies instead of forcing us to go one by one by one and bring multiple actions against a single company. It's those tools and the range of enforcement options that are the keys to this being successfully enforced no matter what form it takes. Um, and as I've said before, you know, we look forward to having a conversation after hearing what folks say in the hearing today to really drill down on what is the right policy and, and we can look at the fine amounts then. Thank you. Would you recommend requiring the extension of the bills, uh, the sharing of any specific information from the apps? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. W would you recommend the extension or the permanent uh, laws that remain in place? I, um, I, you know, this is again, a question that I wanna hear from the restaurant side. I'm very mindful in the first hearing that many restaurant owners spoke about how they would voluntarily assume the, the egregious costs of an app when it was 10% of their sales and they had a, a bustling business in their restaurant. Um, but that when they were forced to do all delivery and takeout, that they were losing money with, with every order. Um, I hope that some of the folks who, who made those points are going to speak today and, and give us their sense of, of how uh, this law's continuation is needed. I'm also aware of businesses, as I mentioned earlier, that, um, that believe they failed, uh, a business that believe it failed because it couldn't purchase premiums uh, advertising content. And um, you know, and again, I, I did highlight that uh, in its current form, I think the definition is problematic because it, it really does allow the companies to simply shift their business model or, or change services um, and creates a situation where an advertising company could offer the same advertising services at 15%, but as if they were to also include delivery, they could only charge 5%. Um, I will say I'm not an economist, um, and and so I, you know, these are concerns that I raise for for other people with more training and expertise, and and for the business owners who make these day to day decisions to weigh in on. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm looking forward to continue this dialogue with you um, as we figure out how we move forward and in the, what's in the best interest of the industry and all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Jones, are we ready to call in uh, DCWP? Uh, DCWP is present for questions if you have any questions for them. If not, we can move on to questions from other council members if there are any. Uh, do any of the council members show that they have any questions? And just for the record, we've been joined by council member Perkins here in Chambers. No chair, no council members over Zoom have any questions. Then I just have a question for DC uh, WP. Would enforcing any of, this, any of these bills become easier if the city licensed the platforms to operate in the city of New York? Are they with us? Steven, I, I think we can't hear you. Although you're unmuted, the sound isn't coming through. Do you hear me now? She can hear oh, yeah, them. Yeah. I think Steven's having a technical issue with his sound. So perhaps we can, we can move on. Okay. Then I have no other further questions, but I hope if they get back online that DCWP will answer would enforcing any of the bill, bills become easier if the city licensed the platforms? And secondly, as a follow-up, is there anything the council could include in any of these bills that would make enforcement easier? Can you hear me now? 
Now we hear you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to, to thank you, Chair, for, for having this hearing and, and uh, the seamless transition. I guess it wasn't so seamless if uh, you couldn't hear me earlier, but that was on my end, so my apologies. Um, I think, and I, I thank you for recognizing uh, our agency because we do, as you, as you know, the, the bills, the permanence of, the, of these regulations as comp contemplated are drafted into our title and do contemplate uh, DCWP to have a long-term role in, in this regulatory space. I think for us, um, licensure in of itself is not a panacea for, for rectifying any kind of behaviors um, in an industry. It's really about the understanding like how pervasive certain practices are and then like taking that information and then adapting an enforcement model that, that, is, that is workable there. So like a licensure in of itself is really just registering with the city um, and all of that. And yes, there are, uh, you know, it, depending on the license, there are different regulatory schemes that come with that, but the licensure in of itself isn't necessarily a panacea. And I think we've seen that. I know, Chair, we've worked uh, closely together on the small business relief bills that, that passed uh, out of uh, the council recently. Some of those regulations that we, that, that, that we discussed with committee staff and, and the speaker staff and, and your staff involved kind of repealing some licensures that we thought, you know, after the fact didn't make a lot of sense for stakeholders as well as um, for the agency itself. Um, so that's all to say that I think really it boils down to like the enforcement structure at the end, um, uh, at the end of the day, rather than the licensure itself. Um, and if you would allow me just like a, a minute um, to, to speak to um, just the, the concept of what long-term regulation would be and DCWP's role there. In general, our agency as a consumer and worker protection agency skews to that work exactly, literally protecting consumers, protecting workers. These bills contemplate business to business transactions and as such, would require resources for the agency. This is a new regulatory work for us. It's something that we ourselves are interested in hearing from stakeholders on. Um, and I know that depending on what we ourselves hear from stakeholders, we're interested in, in working with the council on like adaptive enforcement models that may be most effective and not necessarily carry the resource burdens of like a case by case enforcement model. And we have examples of that, whether it's a, a pattern and practice model that my colleague Christian had mentioned or calling on other laws that are on the books like the Freelances and Free Act, for example. The backbone of that enforcement structure contemplates our agency serving and corresponding or intaking complaints from uh, complainants and then corresponding with respondents um, and then depending on what we hear, if we don't hear anything, it would serve as you know, a, uh, a, uh, a rebuttable uh, presumption in a court uh, for, for the complainant. Um, these are all things we're kind of spitballing here. These are all things that are possible, less resource intensive, but possibly also effective um, in the terms of regulating in this space. Thank you. Um what do you anticipate the market impacts will be if the council enacts a permanent commission cap? Is that a question for DCWP or? Yeah, from your end then, and perhaps we'll ask um, OSE to come back on, but. Sure. Um, so I think uh, as, as the Office of Special Enforcement testified to, there is, a potential concern certainly from DCWP's end, we're always very sensitive to this issue of uh, the unintended consequence of uh, when you cap profit margins for a particular business or entity, some of those costs flowing down to consumers invariably, that's a concern. It's something that doesn't necessarily prohibit counsel or suggest that we shouldn't do anything here because of that risk. But it's something that we want to work with you and your staff on, for example, to see how we can kind of limit that um, unintended expectation. I don't think anyone here wants to see, uh, you know, the average New Yorker who has certainly been affected financially by the pandemic, you know, seeing a higher cost at the end of the day invariably. I don't think that's your intent. It's not the council's intent. It's not, certainly not ours. So that's one uh, potential um, output from this. In terms of others, like I said, I'm, I'm really interested in hearing from, from uh, stakeholders after our testimony um, to get a sense of like what, 
what this landscape really looks like and then um, you know working with you and your staff on on, on what what's best moving forward thank you and my last question to you and I think I asked it early on what is the council can do to help you with the enforcement of these laws yeah um, well I think it's going to depend on where we land on what what's the structure if we're talking about a case-by-case -case model that is the most resource intensive model a complaint based model that you were um, kind of discussing with with my colleague at, at OSE that's new needs for our agency that's like I said we don't have a lot of visibility in the business to business transactions so it's not like an attorney can just step into that work um, because you know, they're not specialized in that. I don't think anybody wants um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, a, I think we want a specialized team looking at this is I guess what I'm trying to say. But as I mentioned, there are other less resource intensive models that also may be effective that get to your, um, your ultimate goals, uh, Chair. And that includes adopting models from, like I said, either the existing laws and what we've seen as effective, perhaps the Freelances and Free Act is, a, is one example, um, or adopting a pattern and practice enforcement model as well. So depending on those, I think we can certainly discuss, you know, what those day-to-day -day impacts would be for our agency. But, um, you know, I think we're, we're looking forward to like bridging, bridging those gaps and concerns with you um, as this legislative process moves on. Thank you so much for your time. Ms. Jones, if we can call up the next round of panelists. Sure, thank you, Chair. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please observe the two minute timer as we have a large amount of panelists registered to testify today. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you on Zoom. Panelists, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to set the timer and announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Please be patient, we will get to everyone. I would like to now welcome Andrew Ding to testify, followed by Yaniv Cohen, and then Amy Healy. Andrew? Um, yes, one second, I'm just trying to un unlock my video, but okay, here we go, start video. Okay. Your time is Okay. So um, I'm speaking to the phone order charge situation. Um, so the reason why this was even brought to your attention in the first place, was because these companies simply could not be trusted to do the right thing on their own. I wasn't the first to bring this situation to anyone's attention. In fact, there were lawsuits brought to um, these companies years beforehand. Um, and it wasn't until media coverage and also the hearings last year in August, and also um, subsequent evidence that I um, emailed and, and submitted to, I think is the OSC, um, that anything was actually done about it. And I, I can confirm that the amount of um, fraudulent calls has reduced. Um, I can also um, report back that I've not to date been able to get any kind of um, reply back about the audits that were promised about the fraudulent charges that I re received last year. So there is no resolution on any of those. And I've attempted to reach out to my account um, point of person, I've attempted to call customer service reps at Grubhub and Seamless to no avail. Um, so <clears throat> what, what I feel like is necessary about these um, bills becoming permanent is to send a clear message that, look, you clearly can't be trusted to do the right thing on your own. Um, so we're going to have to step in and, and make sure that Restaurants are protected from you. And unfortunately, that is the case. So um, yeah, I, 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 I feel like it's crucial that the, it's kind of ridiculous that it even has to be a bill about not charging for phone calls that don't result, result in orders. Um, but here we are. 
So yeah. Mr. Dink, thank you for your testimony. How many erroneous phone orders did you find in the time that you spent going back through your bills? So I found 50, okay, so I audited 55 phone calls. Only three of those phone calls resulted in an actual order. That is a margin of error of 95%. And I don't think anyone is stupid enough to, to believe that that was not in an intentional algorithmic um, scheme, okay? So you cannot be that incompetent to create a system that was only 5% correct at any given time. And Matt Maloney's public statements in reply to my kicking up a stink in the press was very indicative of the fact that he thought this was like beneath even talking about. He, he brushed it off as oh, overblown, as, as if like I should be somehow grateful for all the things that they do. And I may, perhaps I could just like, uh, you know, disregard it somehow and maybe say that they deserved to take extra money from me. I don't know, it was very, very bizarre. But at the same time, these, these phone charges just um, <clears throat> kept, on, kept, kept on coming. So, yeah. Mr. Ding, did you bring this to the attention of OSE? Yeah, I gave them. I gave them the entire um, uh, recording catalog. I, everything was very clearly labeled for them. Um, I haven't actually since followed up with them to tell them that um, I haven't rec received any kind of communication or follow up. Um, so that that's that's something that you know I'm bringing to their attention today. Thank you, Mr. Ding, and I certainly will be following up with you and my staff will be uh, setting up a time for us to meet and discuss this as well so we can follow through with OSC and the relevant uh, agencies and departments. And I apologize that um, this was unknown to me. I thought this, based on your last testimony, was being addressed, and now we're finding out it's not. So um, I, I see one of the council members has raised their hand, and I'm not sure if it's pertaining... Uh, to your question. Uh, Council Member Brennan, I see your hand is raised. Chair, that's one of the registrants uh, who will be testifying later. No okay. council members have raised their hand. Then we will follow up with you and we'll stay in touch. Uh, Council Member Perkins uh, has a question. Um, wait, oh, they got this put on the mic. I, I, I heard more than once something about some fraudulent calls that were being uh, put in play. And I guess I'm, my interest is what, is what is the fraudulent that these calls are representing and how are those man, being managed or uh, being dealt with so that the best interest of the community and of the council is being adequately addressed. So what is this fraudulent call problem that apparently has become part of the discussion. That's a question for me. I, I think that was a, a statement more than uh, a question, correct, uh, Council Member Perkins? For me, it's a question as to what are these fraudulent calls mm. that have come up in this conversation yeah. and what, how are they being addressed and, and what are the implications of these frauds? as they are being articulated today. I mean, are we hearing that we have fraud taking place? Uh, uh, Mr. Perk Councilman Perkins, and that's exactly it. These erroneous charges for phone orders that did not yield a sale was the purpose of this law. And um, this restaurateur has brought it to the attention of OSE and apparently of the 55 calls, only three uh, resulted in a sales transaction, and yet he was charged for 55, and that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. And we're going to be following up with the restaurateur and the relevant agencies and departments to ensure that, uh, one, that doesn't happen again, and two, that we make this restaurant whole on those charges. Thank you. So, Mr. Dane, we will stay in touch, and I'll follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Thank you, Andrew. Next, I will call Yaniv Cohen, followed by Amy Healy, and then Thomas Gretsch. Yaniv? 
the time will begin. I see Yaniv Cohen is not present currently, so we will move on. Um, next, we have Amy Healy, followed by Thomas Gretsch, and then David London. Amy? The time will begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Jonai and members of the committee. Thank you for your time today. My name is Amy Healy, and I'm the Head of Government Affairs at Grubhub. New York and its restaurants hold a special place in the hearts of everyone at Grubhub and Seamless. We've been proud to partner with the city and organizations across it to support local restaurants and advocate for important public policies that support restaurants and drivers, like the delivery worker bills the council is currently considering. We stand in support of those proposals. And since the pandemic began, Grubhub has stepped up to support New York, investing tens of millions of dollars to directly support the city's restaurants and their employees and organizations that serve the communities throughout the city. But we strongly oppose the fee cap proposal being considered today, which would place permanent price controls on the contracts freely entered into between restaurants and third party platforms they choose to partner with. This unprecedented action, if passed, would have damaging and long term consequences for New York's restaurants, delivery workers, diners, and the local economy. The Latino Restaurant Association, in its opposition to permanent fee caps, has acknowledged that fee caps upset the cost balance of delivery price out some Latino families by making food delivery too expensive and unfairly penalize some of our most vulnerable small restaurants and neighborhoods. The fees paid on orders are negotiated in a private contract between Grubhub and the restaurants we serve, and they reflect the services a restaurant operator has chosen for their specific business. Many of the restaurants on the Grubhub platform choose to util utilize only our marketing and related services to drive more orders. Some restaurants choose marketing and delivery because they don't want the burden and expense of hiring their own delivery workers. And some restaurants simply want the option to receive orders online, which is why we launched Grubhub Direct, which offers commission-free online ordering. A permanent price control like the one proposed would severely limit Grubhub's ability to offer these services. But beyond the significant negative impacts, we are confident a court would strike the proposal down based on its numerous legal shortcomings. These issues have been outlined in great detail by outside counsel and shared with committee staff. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Haley. Thank you for uh, being here and uh, testifying. Um, and thank you for um, always agreeing to meet and discuss the issues. Please, in layman's terms, explain the long-term consequences again so I could understand on the, uh, regarding the, the caps. Sure. So um, as, as I, I believe the gentleman from OSC uh, commented, if, if our fees are capped, our vendor's fees are not. So we have, we have hard costs for the marketing and advertising services that we pay. So we have to pay Google to run Google AdWords programs, et cetera. So those, you're not capping those fees. You're only capping our fees, which means we need to in, increase fees somewhere else. And those could be on the consumer, which as I commented, um, the Latino Restaurant Association has said the more price sensitive consumer will be um, greatly impacted, as will low order volume restaurants. So restaurants that, you know, a $90 sushi order can absorb a dollar or two fee, a $20 order maybe, maybe won't. And then those orders will become less attractive. So diners will lose out, restaurants will lose out. And then the work that drivers rely on in New York City during the pandemic will lose out. So what you're saying is if they don't pay for the marketing or the um, increased marketing that you're able to provide them, that ultimately it will cost them? Is that what you're saying? No, no. What I'm saying is if you cap our ability to charge what our costs are and, mm -hmm. and force us to operate at a loss, then we have to try to make up those losses somewhere. And Grubhub operated at a loss our recent quarter. So what about the restaurant that's ordering, uh, that's operating at a loss? When the restaurants were closed because of government action, mm -hmm. we complied with the fee cap. Now that restaurants are open, they have more of a choice on the partners and the vendors that they choose to work with. If they're not finding value by partnering with Grubhub, they are welcome to choose other partners. 
Right. So we're talking about the industry overall, and because you were, you're speaking on behalf of Grubhub, I don't want to focus just on Grubhub. But in Grubhub, in third quarter 2020, uh, 494 million, a 53% year over year increase. In revenue, yes. In revenue. But we operated at a loss. Yet I saw another report that during the pandemic, it was a $50 billion increase in revenue and as a whole, profits of $5 billion. Uh, 50 and, billion, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with the numbers that, that as, you're going. I will find that question. For, I will find that report for you. But I, I recall reading a report that showed a $50 billion increase in gross sales for third-party platforms um, across nationally, that is, which yielded a $5 billion profit to those companies. Uh, again, Councilman Joe and I, we're a publicly traded company, and you can read our financial earnings. Um, they're on our website um, and, of course, posted with the SEC. So I, I can just tell you what our, you know, what we reported. I'm not familiar with the numbers that, that you're saying, but we did operate at a loss our last quarter. And, and again, happy to share those earnings with you. Thank you. So we're, now we're talking about profit and loss for Grubhub. And you're saying currently you're operating at a loss. And if you're not able to increase your fees that you charge, you cannot operate at a profit. Um, and that's going to hamper your business model, obviously. So if I apply that same principle to the restaurant that you are partnering with, if they are operating at a loss today, after being open and getting through the pandemic, you're saying that they should be able to pay an increase or remove this cap going back to the predetermined contract negotiations that you had. That will help them. I'm saying that this during the pandemic, that um, artificial price caps we went along with. Now right. that restaurants are open, they're free to increase their prices, just like we're free to increase ours. So restaurants can make business decisions that make sense for them. And if they think it makes sense to work with us, we welcome that opportunity. And we appreciate the tens of thousands of restaurants in New York City that do. Um, and if they don't think that we're a good partner, um, then there are plenty of, of options out there, including several of my you know, friends and colleagues and other companies that will be speaking today. Right. And thank you for that. And I'm just pointing out because the argument that you made is some of these smaller mom and pop owned eateries will not be able to survive. And this would be a further burden on them. They could not absorb the one dollar charge that you were referring to if their order is only twenty dollars. So we just painted a scenario that Grubhub is their solution and their answer uh, that marketing their um, their menu is going to. Uh, although they'll be paying more than they currently are, will ultimately lead them to profit. I, I didn't say that. Okay. I didn't say that. I said they can make the business decision that makes sense for them. And, and again, when restaurants were closed, it's a different dynamic. Now that restaurants are open, they can choose to hire their own delivery um, service. They can pay the insurance. They can pay the wages, whether or not that delivery uh, individual might be busy that day or not. With, when they work with us, they only pay a delivery fee when there's an actual delivery. These are all the decisions that the, the restaurant owner can make. Um, and as I mentioned, I was quoting a letter from the Latino Restaurant Association right. that said a, even a small fee can be a hurdle to some communities um, that are very price sensitive. And I'm happy to share that entire um, letter with you. And that's what I was referring to, the letter on the Latino Association. And I, I would be more than happy to look at that letter. Um, please elaborate more on the impact if these caps are permanent, what it would mean to Grubhub or the industry. I think as we discussed, we are a publicly traded company and we would need to increase costs somewhere um, or make business decisions to operate um, to, 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 to stop the losses that we've been operating under this artificial cap. Right. I, I'm not the business person, so I, I can't tell you exactly what we would do. Um, but, you know, we, we are a business and we need to um, make sure that we are operating in a sustainable way for our shareholders. Right. And I think that's the argument we just made, that those restaurants, if they're not profitable, they would have to 
find ways to raise revenue or profit levels. And they would have to raise their menu prices to a level of profitability. That would be the ultimate goal. I, I'm not a restaurateur. That's that's up to the restaurateur to decide how to operate their business. I, I think I've asked this question before. Um, your, your model, um, I believe, was 30% fee for marketing and delivery, correct? And that's where you want to see this go back to? We, I want to see it go back to the rate for a suite of services that the restaurant chooses. So we have uh, different prices depending on what the restaurant chooses to buy. Um, and and it, advertising, as you know, costs more to advertise on the Super Bowl than it does uh, on late night you know, cable. So it depends on the exposure that the restaurant wants. They work with their uh, account executive and develop the package that works for them. I wish our uh, restaurants had account executives. I mean, that, that would be making these terminations for them, but apparently they deal with sales agents that determine what their budget is and what they could afford and with the assumption that there would be a return on their investment. That's the whole idea here. We're just trying to get a better understanding of the impact now that we've had some time to evaluate the impact that these bills have had on the industry on all stakeholders, whether it be the third party delivery food apps or the restaurant uh, industry. Uh, is there anything else that you can add to this, Amy, uh, when we talk about the legislation that has been in, uh, uh, that has been put into place during the pandemic? And aside from the cap bill, the other legislations you're OK with, uh, they're acceptable to the industry um, and you support. The uh, happy to go through them. The non-partnered legislation where uh, platforms don't list um, restaurants without a written agreement. I believe it's written agreement. We are fine with that. Um, the ordinance that requires um, no charges for a phone order if there's no order. Absolutely, we support that. We've taken many steps. Council member, I've been here about a year and a half. I think you and I met when I was six weeks in. Um, we've worked very diligently since um, since the first time you and I have met, um, we're putting into place additional um, controls on our phone order system, including a live call center um, to remove the automation. Um, and, and we look forward to sharing more about that. I think we had an opportunity to talk about that a couple of weeks ago. Um, I believe, uh, it, so I'm trying to think of the, uh, uh, the next ordinance, if you want to the other one is listing phone numbers. If you um, allocate your own number, or that the restaurant number should also be included and identified as um, the direct number to the restaurant. You support right. that? We're, we're, we're continuing to review that, uh, Councilman Joe and I. We have a lot of restaurants who don't just advertise with us. They advertise with other, maybe it's with uh, Yelp or other marketing platforms. And we're able to show them, here are the number of calls that came through your advertising with us. Maybe they have a different number on Yelp. They're able to see where their advertising is spent. Um, businesses tell us they like to understand where their advertising revenue are actually driving orders. And so we're able to do that by using a unique number. This is not new technology. It's not unique to delivery platforms. The Yellow Pages has used it for decades. Um, different ads and different size, uh, different numbers and different size ads or different headings. And then a business can see okay, now I know where I'm getting my leads from and I can reallocate my advertising dollars um, in a smarter way. Thank you. The, uh, the bill 2359, which permanently extends the existing commission cap, are there any other models that you would like to suggest that would reduce commission fees for restaurants? And I only ask this question because the reports that we're getting consistently are saying, the fees that we're paying lead to a net loss on every transaction. And the 20% fee that is currently being paid, 15% for delivery, 5% for marketing, or vice versa, uh, if you did no delivery and just a straight marketing fee, is not yielding a profit to these restaurants. Council member, if if RevHub isn't delivering the order, which we only do in about half of the instances, and we're capped at 5% and the restaurant is still operating at a loss, I haven't seen the economics of that. So happy to review that. 
So the answer to these restaurants that show me that here's my profit and loss, and this is how my profit margins are, my business may be open for business. I am still not receiving walk-ins. Uh, they're not at a level of pre-pandemic. Uh, I am continuing to operate and will continue to operate a loss. My customers now have become um, phone order delivery using delivery app uh, rather than in-house dining. Uh, they're not coming to the window. They're not walking in. They're relying on these platforms. And here's how my bottom line cannot sustain it because I don't have the increase in gross sales across the board to cover my overhead currently. Council member, there are a lot of vendors to restaurants. Um, so to single out one vendor to a restaurant, um, we believe is discriminatory. Again, if, if the restaurant's find it cheaper to hire their own delivery service, um, clearly they're, they're, they're more than welcome to do that. They find it off. In, in fact, one of the last hearings that I attended, a restaurateur was asked, well, why don't you hire your own delivery service rather than pay Grubhub? And by the way, we only charge 10% for delivery when there's no fee cap. Um, and the restaurateur said that it was too expensive. They, did, they didn't want to do the background check. They didn't want to pay a delivery driver if there was no business that night. So again, that's a business decision that the restaurant makes. Right. Um, I, I, when you were referring to the report, was that by the New York State Latino Restaurant Bar and Lounge Association? No, it was not. It was by Lily Roca, who's the CEO of the Latino Restaurant Association. She published a letter in the San Francisco Examiner, um, I believe last week, when because the city of San Francisco is considering a permanent fee cap as well. Uh, what was the name of the organization in full, please? San Francisco was the Latino... It's, it's the Latino Restaurant Association, and we'll share the letter. It was published in the San Francisco Examiner. Because I'm also looking at the New York State Latino Restaurant Bar and Lounge Association, um, which I believe is led by uh, Garcia, uh, said that groups revenue hungry members as distraught at Grubhub's fees. For Grubhub to take advantage of this uh, reliance during the midst of a global health pandemic is um, the, the fees certainly don't outweigh the um, the gross revenues of the restaurant industry. Uh, and that's coming from the New York State Latino Restaurant Bar and Lounge Association. Um, so do you see any hybrid that in your mind would work for both your industry and these restaurants? And we've spoken about this in length. The restaurant and eatery industry is a very vital part of this city, not only for the cuisine and it's a part of our actual culture, but they are actually a uh, tax block. They contribute to the tax base of the city and a huge employer for New Yorkers. And they're an industry that we want to preserve and protect and to assure that they continue to thrive in a perfect world where ultimately the prices aren't so high that the consumer no longer frequents that establishment, because that would be the answer. If you want to make, if you're charging 30% and you're looking to make 10% profit and the restaurant obviously wants to make 10% profit, now we're looking at what price for a hamburger that the customer is going to have to pay to please everyone so that there is a profit. What hybrid would you imagine in a perfect world in a very complicated city like New York, where eateries are a vital part of the integrity of this city? Well, first of all, um, RepHub's profit margins without caps are about 1% on an order. Um, and again, we're operating at a loss with these caps. In a perfect world, you know, the, 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 the marketplace would, would set the prices, right? Um, without government interference. I, I, I'm with you on this. I, uh, if you heard my opening statement, I am I not did. a supporter of government interference, but there is also responsibility from government to protect industries, uh, such as, uh, in particular, the restaurant industry. Uh, we cannot just have them uh, close shop. We cannot have them uh, stop contributing to the tax base. They are a part of this culture uh, as much as the arts are uh, in New York City. Uh, we want to preserve and protect and allow all to flourish. Um, 
and I think yeah, and we agree we, we you know seamless and grubhub don't exist without a flourishing local independent restaurant scene absolutely which is why we um have gone along with the caps why we launched a commission free product called grubhub direct where we will allow our technology to power a restaurant's own website right one of the barriers one of the reasons restaurants feel that they need to use one of our apps is because it's expensive and complicated to run a sophisticated e-commerce ordering platform so we will uh grubhub direct is a new product we launched several months ago that allows them to use our technology on their website on their back end seamlessly and we do not charge a commission on those orders because the restaurant drove the traffic to their website we charge a commission when we drive an order when diners choose to come to us because of the user experience because of the security we provide uh, because of the customer service um, the loyalty so when a when a diner goes to a restaurant that's their lead we don't charge a commission for that even if we power the transaction if a diner comes through the Grubhub marketplace that and they make an order right we don't pay for eyeballs we only the restaurant pays when an order is made but um Grubhub direct doesn't put them on the marketplace is that correct or limited no, that no that's their website we're powering their website powering if they want them. to be on marketplace then then there's a charge for that okay um out of curiosity, where is Grubhub's headquarters? Our headquarters is in Chicago. In Chicago. Um, so, you, and I read, because I'm just playing this back in my own mind as we're looking at and thinking of tax base and just finishing New York City's budget, um, which was done yesterday, $100 billion. And now we're looking for sources of revenue to keep this going for the future. It's going to be very difficult. And we're looking at tax bases. I'm not sure if you could even answer this question. Does Grubhub pay any taxes in the form of income tax, not sales tax, uh, to New York City? Uh, I'll have to talk to our, our tax people and get back to you. And which also makes it even more important that if we know our restaurants are contributing to the tax base through real estate taxes, through income tax, uh, and other uh, franchise fees and taxes that we uh, we bestow upon them. It's more important that we protect them um, instead of a, and I'm again, not knowing Grubhub or the other providers. Uh, I would, I would hate the scenario of where a percentage of uh, the sales transaction is leaving our city and going through a different state uh, and not contributing to our tax base. Uh, it's another I'm happy to, to get back with you again, public company. So this information uh, shouldn't be uh, difficult to obtain. Uh, I didn't prepare for that. Um, we do have an office at, at Bryant Park um, where normally, uh, right now, we're a, at a return to work pilot program. Um, but after Labor Day, we expect to bring the bulk of the 500 employees base there back. Um, so it is our second largest office um, after Chicago. And I believe uh, so, uh, Council Member Moya has a question for you, um, Ms. Haley. Council Member? Thank you, Chair. I got a I got a few questions if you don't mind. Um, of uh, thank you, Ms. Haley. So, just sticking to what uh, the where the chair was going with this, um, how many full time employees do you actually have uh, in New York City? Not independent contractors, right? Full time employees. Uh, I, I believe close to five hundred. Okay. Um, now, what is the cost of your company to operate uh, the platform? all the technology I, I i don't have that handy okay could you get that information please sure okay and uh how much is it to list a restaurant what do you mean to just put it on our platform yeah. um i i don't have the exact cost of that again you know it depends on where you want to be on the platform do you want to be like um, but you have options right if i want to get different options uh for right. uh, whatever service, right? What's the lowest and what's the highest? Uh, generally, the lowest is between 12 to 15%. 12 to 15% is the lowest. The highest right. would be what? Depends on the restaurant. What They, they can pay whatever they choose to pay. Um, there are restaurants who open a new restaurant who really want to do, as you can imagine, a big grand opening and, and buy a lot of advertising. I mean, they might buy it from us. They might 
they might buy balloons, they might buy signage, they might, you know, buy an ad in the local paper. Um, it's up to the restaurant. To uh, on how much it's going to cost them to list on your platform. No, if you're you're asking that the the top, if they want to do a coupon, they can choose to do a coupon. They can go through Valpack and say twenty percent off, and the restaurant eats that twenty percent, or they can do a twenty percent off coupon through through Grubhub. What I'm, what I'm saying is, if I'm a restaurant and I wanna and I wanna uh, uh, list my service on your platform right. on Grubhub. What is the lowest cost? What is the, what is the, do you, do you have packages? How do you offer these to the restaurants is what I'm trying to get. Through our account, every restaurant has an account executive um, that walks them through it. Okay. That, that's how. But, but do you have something? They, we don't, we don't list our prices on, on the website. The you, account executive, we you have don't different list your prices on the website. That's right. Why? Because the account executive, they're all customizable. And again, you asked what's the lowest price. It's between 12 and 15% to be on the marketplace. Okay. But I, I, you just they said- They sign a contract, uh, council members. So everything, there's no, there's no nefarious business going on. All the rates are in their contract that they agree to with us. Okay. So how much does it cost to process an order uh, through Grubhub? When, when you say, what do you, the credit card processing? Yep. Um, it's- three it's about three and a half percent okay I, I, we can get more specific okay and how much did you charge restaurants for each of those like prior to COVID? so like if i'm placing if i'm placing an order right through through grubhub uh the processing fee you're charging the restaurant is just the uh credit card processing fee is that all you're charging them it's the credit card you have fee. To pay a fee as well to Grubhub because an order was placed through your um, app. The credit card fee is is what the processor is charging, plus uh, a nominal amount for our fraud. We cover a fraud credit card fraud for the restaurants. So if a diner, for some reason, doesn't pay the restaurant because the credit card um, was canceled, or for some other reason, Grubhub eats that loss. And so a, a small portion what, of that fee what's covers the, that. What's the, what's, the, what's the cost of processing an order through Grubhub? It's about three and a half percent. I can get you exact numbers. Just, so it's three and a half percent, which is just the credit card processing. No, no that, that's... Sorry, I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to be clear here because you said the credit card charges three and a half percent. Then you said that you charge a nominal fee in case of fraud. So my question is, what is the total processing fee for an order that is being done through Grubhub? I believe the total is um, a little bit less than three and a half percent. And I'll confirm that with you. I've texted my team now, okay. including well, everything, including everything, council member. Okay, including okay. the credit card fee and whatever yes. nominal fee that is that you charge is less than 3%. I didn't say it, less than three and a half. Three, less than three and a half. Yeah, right. I'll, con I'll confirm that really, with you. Okay? It, really, it, it would be very helpful if we actually knew the cost of what it is to process yes. and, and, and Grubhub, Grubhub has had extensive conversations uh, with the OSC and provided a reams of information about our credit card processing fees. Um, so while yeah, but I'll we talk. don't, we're, you're, you're at this hearing, I right? Know. And, and you don't know what it costs to actually put a, an order through your own company's app. I I, I, it's less than three and a half percent. And I just asked somebody to text it to me. It's, it's something that this should, you should be prepared to know exactly what it costs to do an order through your own company app, right? Like, I don't think that we are asking anything that no, you and, and I'm not trying to their team to go back and find out what that is. I would like to get that please before sure. uh, you're done testifying. Um, and I'd also like to know how much it was prior to, to COVID. Uh, look, we've, we've heard from, from restaurants that their contracts and rates with uh, third party apps, uh, have increased without being informed or resigning the contract. Uh, what do your contracts with restaurants look like? Uh, and why would this happen? What is the process of, of, of changing the contract? Uh, we, we, we don't change the contract without the um, restaurant's permission. 
Um, our contract is a two-page contract on our website, easily found, happy to share it with you. And it can be canceled by the restaurant at any time. There's no long-term uh, agreements required. There's mm -hmm. no sign-up fee. So the restaurant, if, if they don't like the value that they're getting, they can cancel it at any time. Okay. Uh, what does your marketing service provide? And, and, and what is, what is the, the hard cost? Uh, of those services? Uh, the hard cost of those services, um, Google is our largest vendor. So in order to get, we have 33 million diners uh, that look to Grubhub for, for local restaurants. So in order to reach those diners, we have extensive marketing and advertising and AdWord campaigns, search engine optimization, and other hard costs by vendors um, in order to surface these local restaurants to these diners. Okay, so, so what's the actual cost for the Google ad? It, 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 it depends on the market. Um, Google has a lot of different, um, as, as you can imagine, it depends on the keyword. It depends on the geography. Um, right. so, so you don't have examples of like what you offer restaurants when you go in and say, look, if we're going to market your restaurant here, here's our basic package of what we can deliver for you and we can scale it to whatever you want. Like, wh where is that's, sort of the- that, That's right. The, As I mentioned, to get on the platform, it's about 12 to 15, to get on the marketplace, about 12 to 15%. And depending 15 on- what? Of, uh, of the order, that's a fee. When there's an order, not to just get on the market, sorry. There's no fee to get on the marketplace. You only are charged when an order is generated. So that's, that's different than eyeballs. It's not a billboard. You're only- charged when an order is generated. You're not so charged if you don't get any orders and you're on our marketplace. So you're not charging them for marketing. You're only charging them for orders. The marketing that results in orders. We don't charge them just to be on the website. How, how do you determine uh, that that order was placed due to marketing? So if I go on, if I go on Grubhub, if I got the app and I download it here and I want to order from you know, my, my favorite restaurant here. How is that determined? Like, I, I know the restaurant. How do you determine that that order was placed due to advertisement and not just that I, I want to order from the restaurant that's right down the block from my house? How do you because determine that? Because the order is coming through our marketplace. So if there's advertising somewhere and a, a restaurant clicks on that or a diner clicks on that restaurant, and it's our advertising, it's it, the transaction takes place on our marketplace. So we can track that. So, so I, if I download Grubhub right now, right? If I get the app here and I wanna place an order from Mama's in Corona, I know where Mama's is. I didn't see it on any ad, but I'm on your platform, I'm on, on your app. And I click that restaurant to place the order. It, is that you charging them a marketing fee? Yeah, if you made the order on Grubhub, and even yes, it's as if you went on Amazon and ordered from a store that you know is around the corner, but you chose to go on to Amazon. Amazon is taking a, a, a cut of that order. Um, but if you walked around the corner and went to that hardware store yourself, no, Amazon wouldn't be taking an order. And it's, it's analogous to Grubhub. If you right, walked from Grubhub store- you're, you're saying that you use Google as- uh, a part of you, uh, you know, what you charge them for marketing, right? I'm saying I'm going on Grubhub. I'm not, I'm not on any other platform here where I can see advertisement that comes in. Like normally you, you get ads in different platforms. I'm solely on your app. That's considered uh, how you would charge them as a marketing fee because I placed an order on your app? Yes, you chose to came through the Grubhub door. Okay, so then, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, that's, it, that's to me, that's not considered a digital ad for them. They're just listing, that's, that's to me is like the yellow pages, right? I, I get the yellow pages and I got, I pay to be on the yellow pages and then there's a list and I can go on the yellow pages and find out, right? This right. is now moved, right. To, if you if you paid if you paid to be right if you paid to be on the yellow pages you're paying, the difference is, 
you're you're paying the yellow pages whether or not you get any orders you're only paying us if you get an order you're paying the yellow pages just to be but that's, but that's different because you're saying that you have a high cost because you use For Google some orders as yes. a platform right and so i'm just trying to distinguish like what is considered marketing as opposed to memorial, we, are, we are a marketplace like at amazon um and and when you go through the amazon door i don't think any consumer thinks that jeff bezos isn't getting a slice of that transaction you walk well, I'm, talking about grubhub. Door, I'm talking about grubhub right I now understand, i'm, I'm but, trying to make a distinction here on but, what you're saying because you just said that you have a hard cost and it you pay google uh to place ads in their digital marketing form that goes out to so many people i'm saying i go on your app yep. i'm not on any of uh anywhere else i'm still being charged by you as the restaurant because it went through your platform that's correct? right and if you don't want to be on our rest on our platform you don't need to be right but you're saying you're saying that this was all based on the high cost that you have to do a lot of digital marketing. Yes, and, and just, we're not the yellow pages. We do, um, we optimize your menu. We take care of the customer care inquiries, even if you come through the door. We can take care of fraud protection, uh, undeliverable orders. We pay for the support that the restaurants um, might you ask for. So told there's me like, all costs. There's a lot of costs. You haven't given me any like definitive costs of what it is uh, to actually uh, contract with you. Like you tell me we don't list it. Uh, you know, I've talked to other uh, uh, third party apps that actually do list their packaging of what they offer folks. You're saying we just send out our, our, our accounting team or whatever that goes out there and, and deals with this agreement. And that's how we do it. You haven't given me any numbers at all, even just the, the, the simple number of what it costs to process an order through your app. So I want to move on to something are, else, if I could, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, so I just want to be able to get uh, uh, three more questions, and if I could, chair. Um, so, what percentage of the marketing fees prior to COVID uh, went to restaurants' uh, individual advertisement and and support, and how much money was used for ad campaigns uh, for your app? Uh, for example, in the form of banners, uh, in subway cars, et cetera. In New, in New York City or nationally? City, yeah. Well, I, I don't have the New York City advertising numbers. Uh, nationally, we spent about, I, I think it's about $300 million advertising for our restaurants. Okay, but but you, you, you're, you could get us the numbers you spent here in New York City, correct? Uh, yes, that's a, it's one of the data points um, I, I didn't have handy but i'll get it for you i've, I've got the credit card information I'm, and the I'm delivery expecting cost a huge list from you of, of things that i've been asking because I, I i haven't been able to get any any uh real uh numbers from you uh you you also and i i thank the chair also for clarifying because you threw out the latino restaurant association and i was busy trying to google find out what it is uh, they're not based in new york correct that, that's correct okay well you're in new york and you're talking about a fee here, that should have been something that you could have clarified in the very beginning to not make it seem as though it's the uh, Latino Restaurant Association here I, in New I, York I State. never intended, I, I, I never said it was a New York okay, Association. But, but when you come out and you're doing that, it's kind of disingenuous that you don't say that this is from a completely different state. Uh, I, I believe I did say it was a San Francisco examiner. Only article. when the chair asked you to, okay clarify who that was. So I just want to make that very clear. Uh, how many restaurants, the, the, many restaurants have described the third party app as a necessary evil that increases the volume of orders, but doesn't actually net more profits because of the high cost of service. Uh, what data do you have that shows a net gain to the restaurant's profit margin by using your services um, that you provide beyond basic listing that you had uh, you know, prior to COVID? We, we list a restaurant profitability calculator that restaurants can use on our website so they can determine whether or not it makes sense for them to work with us. So that's public and you're free to, to look at that calculator, which you can put in different um, different numbers and it'll, it'll show a restaurant their profitability by working with us. Okay. 
Uh, and my last question is, uh, do you have a geographic breakdown of where orders are placed and from what restaurants are receiving the most? So for example, uh, if you look at the zip code of, uh, of 10014 uh, and uh, 11368 in New York City, would you be able to break down the orders placed and the marketing provided for the restaurants in each of those areas? Uh, I, I, I believe so, yes. Um, I'm not sure how much is, is uh, proprietary um, or, or should be shared with you directly. Um, but, but we should be able to do I that. I just want a breakdown of orders. That, that, that's all I'm asking well, for. We work with over 20, about 22,000 restaurants in, in New York City. Um, but are they broken down by zip code? Yes. Okay. And where we can get them by zip code. Okay. And, and you can break down uh, the orders that were placed and the marketing that was provided for those restaurants in those areas, correct? Yeah, how much our restaurants are spending on our marketing? Yes, the orders, the number of orders that were placed and the marketing that was provided for the restaurants in those zip codes. Yes, we keep track of every order, uh, of every order. Okay, and how much you spent on marketing for each of those restaurants, right? That are listed in that in those zip codes. Uh, I, I I believe so. Yes, I mean some of the marketing we spend is, is TV, obviously. Um, Whatever it may be, okay. you yeah, but, you would have you would be able to give us a breakdown of this. Sure. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Chair. Yeah, real quick, uh, the, the the credit card fee uh, is uh, three point oh five percent plus thirty cents. So you the so again, I'll I'll ask it again. What is the total cost of placing an order through Grubhub? 3.05% plus 30 cents. So you charge the additional 30 cents on top of the 3.5 credit card fee. For the fraud. It's paid by, um, for, again, for our credit card fraud. Yes. Okay. So it's just the only charge. That's place my understanding. Yes, the 3.05% plus 30 cents. Right. So that 3.05% is just a credit card fee. And then you're saying you add a 30 cents additional fee for fraud. To cover our costs for fraud. We lose around $10 million a year to credit card fraud. Okay. All right. I just wanted to be clear that that's what it costs the restaurant. It's just, you don't charge, you don't charge them anything but 30 cents to place an order. That, that's friend. my understanding, yes. Okay. When you say it, that's my understanding, it's, well, I, do we I mean, have, like... We've had extensive conversation. Our lawyers have talked to the lawyers at OSC. I have not, about our credit card fees, I have not been part of those conversations. But I just want to know what it costs to... That, that's, what I'm, that's, what I'm, 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 that's what I'm telling you, sir. Okay. I just think that we've spent, I don't know how long I've been here, and, you know, we, we don't know what it actually is. So if you're telling me it's 30 cents... Okay, but it doesn't seem like it's definitive. You don't know yet. You're saying, you know, I, I still got to check. To me, that, that says a lot. So uh, I hope that we can get the information that I asked. Uh, thank you, Chair, so much for the, for the time. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Amy. You, thank you, Council Member. Ms. Haley, and I think you want to revisit that number because the 3.05% Maybe the fee that's being passed through, but I don't think that's the actual fee. It depends on the provider and the agreement that they have with the credit card company, is my understanding. Well, I, I was trying to get to a closest number as Councilman Moya wanted. It, it is very, we have different processors and they do charge different things. That's my understanding, which is why I, I clarified it that way. There's been reams of paper going back and forth between Grubhub attorneys and OSC. I wish everything could be as simple as one number and one size fits all, but that's often not the case. Thank you. So I'm gonna follow up on just some quick questions. Um, did you cut wages for delivery workers during a period in which the commission cap was in effect? Did we cut wages? No. Yeah, so you didn't, perfect. And again, on this, I'm asking a very specific question. It may not be able to be answered de depending on the different offerings that you have. How much commission as a percentage did you charge restaurants for providing delivery before the commission cap was in effect? 10. 
And once it was in effect, five, 15 for delivery. And right. five for marketing. Right. According to the law. That's right. right. Okay. Can you describe the various services you provide to restaurants and the approximate cost to you to provide these services? And I think that's what council member Moya was actually asking. Uh, Are you talking about delivery? Both, all services that you offer. Some, some cases you offer only marketing. In some cases you're offering marketing and delivery. I don't think you're doing just delivery. That's right. We started out as a marketing company and we didn't offer delivery until about six years ago. Uh, so delivery at 10% um, is obviously to pay the driver, the technology on the app, the customer service uh, to deal with the drivers, the training, the uh, PPE, um, the background checks. Uh, delivery is uh, at 10%, uh, not a money maker for us. Um, we, again, as a marketing and advertising company, um, that's our, our strong suit and that's our focus. Um, we only provided delivery because our competitors started providing delivery. Again, New York's a, a city where restaurants know how to deliver. Um, it's just part of the, the restaurant ecosystem here. And, you know, it, it, they didn't find as much value in meeting delivery as they did in getting to all the New York City diners that prefer to transact this way. Right. And, and I guess that's the difference in your, as you explained, the delivery was just a service that wasn't profitable. You just offering as additional service to your marketing plan when you were charging 10%. Now I would imagine at 15%, it's profitable. We don't break up our, uh, we're still operating at a loss because of the fee cap, Councilman. Okay, well, that would mean if we if it would break if the break even point was ten percent for delivery and you're charging twenty percent for delivery with marketing, that would allow for ten percent uh, to cover your market expenses. What I'm headed at, and if you're saying that ten percent is not covering your marketing expense, depending on which platform, which package, uh, right. you can obviously offer the premium package to everyone. There just isn't enough airtime uh, for you to be able to market all of the pizzerias uh, equally as a premium package. It just wouldn't work for you. So I guess uh, you would need the different tiers um, and they're not all going to be as expensive as the premium tier. That's right. The current bill which has a breakdown of 15% for delivery and 5% for marketing, do you find it fair to allow for a higher percentage for delivery service than for marketing, given the approximate cost you just described? And I guess that's where we're headed with all of this. No, we don't. Um, Grubhub provided, as, as I said, delivery service at 10% uh, because we're primarily a marketing, uh, a marketing company. So, our restaurants come to us for that first and foremost to run loyalty programs for them to run, uh, you know, targeted email campaigns, uh, you know, to optimize their website, to do all of the things that a marketing company does, you know, and an ad agency has real costs. Um, and so to discriminate against that part of the business in favor of the delivery side, um, you know, we, we, we just can't support that. Uh, again, you, you made a comment about the government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we believe that is exactly what happened under the current law. And I, I'm sure you won't be surprised by this because you're going to remain on the hearing. When we talk to the other third party platform providers, they're going to say just the opposite, that marketing is such a minimal expense to them that really the hard costs and the expensive part is the delivery portion. And that's why this bill is so unfair to them. So somewhere between th those that You're are right. focused on delivery and marketing, where no one is happy, which probably means we did something right. If you're well, both uh, that, that, that's, why, that's why we would say, well, first of all, we are different companies. Um, and that's why we would say that the government interfering in this industry is, is skewing. Right. Uh, you know, there, there's no way to, to not skew the economics of, of the industry. Right. So that's why it's important for government to actually for this hearing and for our involvement. So I'm looking at uh, two reports. 
one from Camino Financial and one from Restaurant 365. And both put full service restaurants at a profit margin of three to 5%. Fast casual, which is fast food, anywhere between six and 9%. And then catering service, which doesn't apply to you, but fine dining at four. So the question that we've been asking from the first hearing that we had, please help us understand how this works. If a fast food establishment is making between six and 9% profit on every order, that's their gross pro net profit, how does it benefit them paying upward of 20% or 20% plus the credit card fees that are being passed through? Uh, that in everyone's mind, if we do the same math, that means every sale yields a net loss. Yes, remember, we've had this conversation. You, 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 you profit is calculated after all the restaurant's costs are taken into account. Yet, I, I feel like you're you're separating one cost, which is a, a third-party marketplace. Does that include labor, too? Or does that include their supplies? It, should, it includes everything. The market, so, the, this is an industry standard now. We're look, when every industry, like, well, actually, you should be able to answer this question better than anyone else. Your industry is the restaurant industry. And you are the foremost expert on, on the restaurant industry in New York City. My question to you would be a fast food establishment. What are the net profit margins? As an industry, not specific to one location. I, I, I'm answer. not an expert on the restaurant industry. I, I represent a, a third party marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and as I mentioned to uh, Council Member Moya, we have a restaurant profitability calculator on our website so that restaurants can determine, does it make sense to work with Grubhub or not? If it doesn't make sense, these, these are very smart business owners, as you know, um, then they will not, if it doesn't make sense for them to work with us, then they don't. And we have restaurants that come on and come off all the time because they've made determinations that it did work for me. Maybe now it doesn't. Um, that is their business decision to make, which vendors they choose, which food suppliers they use, what kind of labor uh, that they want. Um, that is not our decision. That is theirs. So two years ago, when we first began these hearings, the whole argument and notion when I asked that question and we talked about profit margins and the fees that were being charged um, for, per order, the argument was called incremental sales that yes, you're paying more on an order that you're through our platform because that customer is going to come back and frequent your establishment. And then we got the reports to show that that wasn't the actual case, that it was actually cannibalizing existing customers and that third-party delivery food platforms are now becoming uh, consumer demand. Uh, and that was prior to the pandemic. During the pandemic, it began the only way um, you can order food and get in touch with a restaurant to have food delivered because of the restrictions. We know that some percentage will go back to in-house dining. But overall, this is now a way of life, a habit including my mother who's never ordered a product in her life on the internet now knows how to order something with a credit card. Uh, and if she could do it, that means everybody's doing it. And now it's normal. If we're looking at an industry that is very vital, and I believe the numbers were 80% of the restaurants within the first five years close as uh, in New York City, we're looking at an industry that is extremely volatile to begin with, let alone these unknown times. Help me understand so that when I'm approached, I say, I, as small business chair, I did everything possible to make sure that there was a fair playing field, that truly there was a partnership between providers and restaurants that benefited both. And there was no need or whatever need there was, we addressed 
through legislation. Can you help me and my colleagues understand how we get there? Sure. Um, first of all, there are several pieces of legislation you're considering that, that GrubHub does support. Um, I would also look to the National Restaurant Association's blueprint for cities and states, what cities can do according to the National Restaurant Association based on their membership, none of which says that fee caps are the answer. There are a list of things in that blueprint, uh, many of which is bureau bureaucracy um, from local cities um, that restaurants face and the fines and the fees and the licenses. And, and you and I have talked about this and you've been fighting this and, and which we appreciate and our restaurants appreciate, but there are a list of things that the restaurants are saying based on surveying all of their restaurant members, this is what states and localities can do. Um, on the transparency issue and listing restaurants without permission, that's on there. Fee caps are not. So happy to sit down with you and go through this list where we can, again, we support many of the things that you're um, considering today and, and happy for us to, to sit down and look at what the restaurants are saying based on their surveys about what they need from cities and city governments like New York. Thank you for pointing that out. I agree with you, but some form of regulation is always needed, uh, whether it be usury uh, regulation for unfair interest, whether it be energy, whether it be housing. Uh, there are industries that have to be regulated to protect consumers uh, and everyday citizens. Otherwise, we would have a muck. Uh, Agreed, and I think it's about striking that balance. Everything else. So the... Uh, although we both agree in a perfect world, markets should regulate themselves. Government intervention is needed because not everyone is going to be fair and transparent and greed and pro driven by profitability, which is okay. That's the way we operate. No one wants to operate at a loss. Um, and that should be the principle for small business. We just want to make sure that these small businesses have a fighting chance. Well, and under these scenarios, your partner, which is the local restaurant, is going through, uh, is questionable on how we come out of this pandemic. Will they survive or not? It, it, council member, one, one area where we would love to have your support and the council support is to help lobby Albany to make alcohol to go a permanent option for restaurants. As you know, that was ended recently. Our restaurants tell us, you know, whether whether they're working with us or not, that increases their margin on every order. And so for the state to let that lapse, you know, we are we are hearing from restaurants complaining that, you know, it, it, it at a time where they need it the most, the high margin product of selling alcohol to go, uh, having that taken away uh, is hurting. So if, you know, we're working to support this in Albany, um, whatever you can do and your colleagues can do, we would certainly appreciate it and the restaurants would appreciate it. I think that's a great idea, but the concern is we go right back to square one again. The profitability, is it 20% on alcohol? Obviously it'll add to your pro profile and increase revenues if we could um, sell alcohol and deliver alcohol, will be uh, increased revenues for you. Uh, the question is, is it sustainable for that restaurant or that establishment where the fee would be 20%? And we go back to the same questions. Any which way I've looked at this and every math that I can possibly come up with on the, every scenario shows me net losses, not profitability. Council member, we'll, we'll share our uh, restaurant profitability calculator. And, and again, if the restaurant doesn't find value in working with us, they have other options. Right. They didn't. Customers. We understand that during the pandemic, um, it was a different scenario. The customer demands now third party delivery food apps. It's a demand. And if you're not offering, I'm sure there are restaurants that would love to say, I'm sorry, I don't accept credit cards. They wouldn't have to pay a credit card fee for the transaction. But the demands are there and they must provide that service. The reality is today in this, and we're looking moving forward, third party food delivery apps are here to stay. 
and they're only going to increase in demand. And that's wonderful, but it's going to be, I can't substantiate profitability levels for third party food delivery apps and not take the same considerations for our restaurants. And we know God knows the consumer ultimately pays for it anyhow. There's only a matter of time before uh, they can't afford the products that are being offered by restaurants. And we go back to a different argument about unhealthy eating and less um, expensive food and the impact that it has on New Yorkers, which already deal with obesity and high blood pressure and all the negative issues because they can't generally afford um, fresh fruit and fresh food, uh, which is more expensive. And ultimately, this is a price that we'll all be paying for to correct and address. I don't have any other questions for you, unless you want to make a, uh, a closing statement. Uh, no, appreciate appreciate the time. It's always it's always a, a fun time talking in front of this committee. Um, I hope we can keep the dialogue going. Like I said, there are things that the restaurants are telling us that they want and need, and you're in a position to to make some of those happen. And and we'd like to work with you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your testimony, Amy. Moving on with public testimony, I will be calling Thomas Gretsch next, followed by David London and then Daniel McCarthy. Thomas? Starting time. I was gonna say good morning, but it's actually good afternoon. Thanks for allowing me this opportunity. And before I get started, I wanna thank Chair Joni, um, a friend of small business for his dedicated service to the city council and to uh, this committee for, for years. Thank you very much, Chairman Jonai. Good afternoon and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Tom Gretsch. I'm the president and CEO of the Queens Chamber of Commerce, the oldest and largest business association in Queens County. I'm, on, I'm here on behalf of our nearly 1400 members to testify in support of the bills you're hearing today that will help small businesses and throughout Queens and New York City in general. Prior to the pandemic, Queens was home to 6,000 restaurants serving cuisine from around the world. These small businesses created jobs and opportunities in every nook and cranny and every community of Queens County, especially for our immigrants and new Americans. They add character to our neighborhoods and are a major driver of tourism to our borough. Sadly, the past 16 months have been incredibly hard on the restaurant industry in Queens. We estimate that nearly 1,000 of those 6,000 have disappeared potentially for forever. Too many cherished neighborhoods have shut their, neighborhood institutions have shut their doors and those that have survived are hanging on by a thread. I wanna take a moment to highlight the four pieces of legislation being considered today that will help these vital small businesses and strongly encourage the committee to pass them as quickly as possible. Intro 2359, from council members Moya and Chair, Gar Chair Jonai would make temporary caps on third party delivery fees, which is scheduled to expire 90 days after restaurants are allowed to return to 100% indoor occupancy permanent. The bill will allow small businesses to keep more of the money they earn and ensure customers are supporting their local restaurants. Intro 2333 from Chair Jonai will require third party delivery services to have an agreement with I'm restaurants. Expired before they can be listed. Sounds like common sense. When third party platforms list restaurants without their permission and okay, they're siphoning off customers who may have otherwise ordered directly from the restaurant, often paying a smaller or no fee whatsoever. It also creates confusion for customers and restaurants as menu items change frequently, in some cases daily. Intro 2356 from Chair Jonai will make permanent the temporary law that- Time expired third party services. In closing, it's been a, a very, very difficult year and the Queens Chamber of Commerce supports these bills. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I wanna thank you for your work and uh, what you've been doing in Queens and throughout the city representing small businesses. We have um, a lot more to do. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Tom. A reminder to Zoom panelists, you do not need to raise your hand on Zoom. We will get to everybody. 
Next, I will be calling Daniel McCar David London, pardon me, followed by Daniel McCarthy, and then George Buono. David? Starting time. Thank you, Chair Joe and I and committee members. My name is David London and I head US East Government Relations for DoorDash. And I'd like to provide DoorDash's perspective on intro 2359, the permanent commission cap legislation. We share the council's commitment to helping local restaurants as they emerge from the pandemic, and we are committed to being a strong community partner. For example, here in New York City, we've expanded initiatives to support restaurants, delivery workers, and community members. Just in the past year, we launched an initiative to support Black women and immigrant-owned restaurants through our Main Street Strong Accelerator. We partnered with the New York City Hospitality Alliance to offer half a million dollars in grants to help New York City small business restaurants. We've also created a range of products and services for New York City's diverse restaurant com community, including options with no commission at all and commission-based options starting at 15%. And recently, we also unveiled new pricing packages, which give restaurants the ability to reach new customers starting at a 15% commission. With restaurant restrictions lifted and so many options available to restaurants, we believe that permanent price control is unnecessary. We also believe that a permanent price control would be harmful especially in communities of color. For example, our dashers who earn $33 per active hour in parts of the city stand to lose an estimated $19 million annually if a permanent cap is implemented. These impacts will be felt most in the, community, the city's communities of color as 89% of dasher earnings go to dashers based in communities of color. Permanent price controls will also increase cost to consumers, creating a regressive tax that makes food delivery less accessible to lower income communities, as 72% of orders are delivered to communities of color. Each lost order means a lost income earning opportunity for a dasher and lost revenue for the restaurant. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today and look forward to working with the city council, council member Moria and chairman join I moving forward. Thank you, Mr. London. Um, thank you for always making your software available as well uh, as we um, try to shape um, a scenario where both restaurants and third party platforms continue to uh, thrive. Can you please elaborate again on the impacts if these fees become, the current caps become permanent and the impacts that you see it will be having on our restaurants, your industry, and the customers. Yeah, the the impacts that these will have specifically, you know, we look at everything from the perspective from our dashers or our drivers, you know, and also partnering with our restaurant or merchant partners. The impacts that we've seen in other places when commission caps are instituted, we see less orders being made, and then thus we see less opportunities for dashers to earn income. So in the places where, where there have been price controls, where we have seen customer order volume go down, and we've also seen prices go up, and then we've also at the same time seen wages go down for dashers. And as I mentioned in my testimony, a lot of these com communities are with the communities of color specifically. And so that's our larger concern when we're starting to talk about permanency of commission caps. I mean, we understood, though we were here last year, you know, arguing against the, the temporary cap, um, but we understood, you know, where the city council was going. We understood the, the hurt that our merchant partners were going through last year, but now we're in a different place. And now we're talking about extending. We can, we can understand the extension if that's where the council goes, but a permanency of commission caps will have long-term impacts on those communities that I mentioned. Thank you, Mr. London. So, you're, the fifteen percent fee for delivery plus five percent for marketing does not work with your model. Well, I would say I would look at it different. You know, our restaurants are looking for choice. You know, and so, for instance, as I mentioned in in my testimony, we've been able to implement new programs to give that choice to restaurants. And so we've implemented a program through our mark partnership programs, which allows restaurants to opt in to a 15% cap, a 25% cap, or a 30% cap, depending on the type of services that they want. The concern here is with a permanency of a commission cap 
at you know capped in at 15 percent or in five percent uh, for marketing that's a one size fits all and as you've heard from you know previous folks we, our business models are very different so i think you know restaurants are looking for choice and a lot of these choices weren't even around a year ago when the pandemic happened so i think giving those choices to our restaurants is the key piece because that's what we're looking for that's what consumers are looking for that's what restaurants are looking for and I'm sure you heard uh, the question uh, that was going on before your testimony. The question is, if we accept the industry standard of 6 to 9% for fast food establishments uh, is the margin of profit, how is it that every transaction is going to benefit that restaurant if they're paying fees of up to 20%, and if this cap is removed, even higher? Well, I think, again, I go back to where the restaurants, what the restaurants want, you know, and I think the services that we provide, not just that we provide, but, you know, some of our competitors provide, is allowing them choice. And I, and I keep coming back to choice, because again, I think uh, Amy mentioned this as well, you know, there's options that restaurants have, they don't have to do delivery or on their particular platform or our particular platform or others. But what we want to do is just make sure that we're enhancing the choices for our consumers or our restaurant partners. So for instance, you know, on, we have a product called Storefront. You know, one of the things we've heard from a lot of our restaurant partners is that they want um, to get closer to the folks that actually order through um, our website, you know, through our marketplace. And so through Storefront, they get a chance to get to know those customers. So we help them build out their own individual websites. They do the orders. They own that relationship with the customer. So again, that's just one other piece that kind of goes in. So so if we're looking at restaurants, some of them may say, I want choice. Some of them may say, I want to do my own storefront. Some of them may say, I want to actually just use uh, you know, DoorDash or other platforms to just pick up my food and just order through their individual website. That's what they're asking for. So again, if we're talking profit margins, it depends on the individual business and individual restaurant and what they're looking for. But what we want to give them is that choice so they can be successful. Did you cut wages for delivery workers during the period in which the commission cap was in effect? No, sir. Okay. How much commission as a percentage did you charge restaurants for uh, providing delivery before the commission cap was in effect? Yeah, commissions, you know, rent run anywhere between 15% to the upper 20%. So it all depends on the individual restaurant. I think a key piece is, is what do actually commissions cover? So commissions actually cover a wide range of, of services. So for instance, they cover, and you all talked about credit card processing fees. There's that. There is actually, you know, um, cost for insurance. There's cost for customer service. Um, and there's some marketing costs, but also most importantly, specifically for the marketplace side, you know, of delivery, it's for paying the dashers. And so, um, you know, commission caps before the pandemic range, you know, just depending on the individual relationship we have with the restaurant. All right. And then to follow up that question, uh, and what was the commission that you were charging after, um, once it was in effect? So you complied and you were charging 15% for delivery and 5% for marketing, I would imagine. Is that the case? Yes, sir. Yeah, we were abiding by the law. Yes, sir. And the pass through of the credit card uh, charge is in addition to these fee? Yeah, um, credit card processing fees are usually charged, as you know, by, you know, the company that we work with and it ranges anywhere between 2% and 3%. What is it? 2 to 3%. So you're charging two to three no, 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 I'm sorry. The credit card processor processes uh, 3% to us. And you don't mark it up. You just make that a straight pass through. Yeah, we, um, yeah, we pass on credit card fees. Their fees are part of the commission. So, you, okay. In addition to the current caps, which are 15% for delivery and 5% for marketing. That's a total of 20%. Is there an additional charge that you add on top of that for the credit card yeah. transaction? Okay. So you're all in at 20%, no fee that's included in the fee that you're currently charging. Exactly, it's inside of the commission. So we don't charge more than 15 plus five in New York City. Thank you for that. And as a follow-up, as you heard during a testimony, 
And I'm hearing now counter, and I think I pointed it out earlier, that one of the arguments that was made is that the marketing is much more expensive than the delivery service. I'm hearing from you otherwise, that the delivery service is much more expensive than the marketing side. No, I'm not, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it's two different business models and there's, you know, there's no right or wrong to either one of the business models. We focus primarily on our marketing model specifically, and that's working with our three-sided business, which includes, again, our restaurants, our, our uh, dashers, and also with our consumers. And so it's just, it's a different business model. That's it. Not, not saying one's better than the other, one's right or wrong. That's just our, our business model is primarily marketplace. Right. But your business model, right, has a breakdown on, you, you know what your profit levels are, your break even based on a service. Yes, Marketing sir. has one, delivery has one. Can I hear from you what that breakdown is? In New York City specifically? Yes, New York City. I mean, again, we play the 15-5, which, which we're obligated under the law to pay. So what, what we, I can do, I can get back to you. If, are you looking for a little bit more than that? I'm just... Yeah, I know what you're charging, but I want to know what your profitability is. Are you profitable under this current cap? I'd have to check with, with our team on that one. Um, but I know it's been hurt. It's, it's been hurting our business. Right. Cause early on we spoke about, we're looking for a perfect world where everybody's making a profit and, um, everything's running smoothly. And we're trying to just trying to determine, uh, the difference between the marketing percentage and the delivery percentage and what, and how we got there. And I believe there was plenty of testimony early on that the argument was the delivery component is much more, much more expensive than the marketing. And that's how we formulated during the pandemic, the 15 plus five. Right. So now that we've had a year to look at this and we all have experience and the, we have enough data to actually make informative decisions. What has been that impact on your model? Yeah. So, so basically this model, again, commission caps in general um, have had a detrimental impact on our model, um, as we've said. And again, because it's making delivery, by the way, and delivery is more expensive because part of the reason why delivery is more expensive because we have to actually pay the dasher, as I mentioned, sort of when I broke down what commission caps actually paid for. So no, these commission caps have not had a positive impact on our business, um, not only just in New York City, but multiple places across the country. And again, going back to what I said earlier, I think we understood and we understood where the city council was, was last year. We understood the hurt of our restaurant partners uh, last year. Um, and so we, and as I think was pointed out as well by the administration, there wasn't any, um, a lot of pushback from, you know, our industry, you know, once the, this particular original bill, the temporary bill last year became in statute, you know, we understood that. But again, this, we're now we're talking more of a permanency in a commission cap, which, you know, completely changes business models. And we kind of look at it as once, you know, we get into the, the, the capping permanently of a lot of different things, where does it stop? You know, you know, um, you know, for our restaurant partners who, who support this, you know, where does it, where does it end? We can cap commissions today in our industry. What's that to say that it won't happen to another industry down the road? So uh, it, it's, it's very concerning where things are going in this, I, but we look forward to working with you as we uh, continue to gather all the facts. Uh, my last question, um, if, the, if this bill permanently extends the existing commission cap, are there any other models you would like to suggest that would reduce the commission fee for restaurants in lieu of a permanent cap? Well, I would say two things. Um, first, if, as you're looking at this, again, I'm still understanding restaurants are still recovering. Um, if you need to temporarily, you know, extend this for a little bit you know, longer, understand 60, 90 days, we, we would understand that. But also, too, there are other models out there, as I mentioned before, giving restaurants choice, you know, so the answer to your question, you know, looking at something that says, you know, there's 15 percent allows restaurants to opt into 15 percent or other higher percentages would be, you know, another solution. Thank you so much, Mr. London.
I'm not sure if any of the colleagues that are present have any questions, uh, Stephanie. No, none on Zoom. Thank you. We'll, we'll follow up and thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next, I'll be calling Daniel McCarthy, followed by George Buono, and then Ike Brannon. Daniel? Start in time. All right, great to be here with you. Uh, thanks for inviting me here today. Uh, my name is Dan McCarthy. I'm an assistant professor of marketing at Emory University's Goizueta Business School. Uh, very grateful to be able to share uh, academic work that I've conducted uh, that I think could be relevant for the hearing. Uh, so I've been studying the impact of the pandemic on consumer behavior in the restaurant delivery category. Uh, there's been a lot of buzz about this research. Uh, it's been covered by the Wall Street Journal, NPR, and The Economist, amongst many other outlets. Uh, so hopefully that's a signal of the quality and relevance of the work. Uh, our results suggest that the pandemic was basically a big gift to the category. Uh, purely because of COVID, delivery sales grew 122% in 2020 nationwide uh, to about $51 billion. <clears throat> Without COVID, we estimate that sales growth would have actually been 38%, a lot lower. So COVID basically created $19 billion worth of food sales uh, for restaurant delivery. And to an earlier point that you made, uh, Chairman Joe and I, uh, DoorDash generated about $300 million in profit over the last 12 months and uh, we infer a very high customer lifetime value for them. Uh, importantly, uh, we find that growth in the category was primarily due to substitution away from restaurant dine-in. So to say it in English, consumers were turning to delivery because they weren't able to physically go to restaurants, but otherwise would have if we weren't in a pandemic. And so the gains were largely one-for-one -one swaps from restaurants to dine-in visits, uh, implying that the growth was basically a large transfer of wealth from restaurants to delivery due to an act of God. And on this level, uh, the apps didn't generate much in the way of truly incremental sales. So while we may see some of these trends revert as we're in the midst of fully reopening on-premise dining in New York City, it's not guaranteed that we're gonna see dine-in go back to pre-pandemic levels. And to the extent that they don't, the transfer of wealth from restaurants to delivery uh, may continue well after the pandemic is over. <clears throat> I hope this has been helpful and interesting. I've submitted a written testimony with more information and I'd be uh, more than happy to I talk about this at your convenience in more depth. <clears throat> Daniel, I want to thank you for um, testifying today and for your written submission. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure you've been following this hearing uh, from this very beginning. Um, it's just very difficult for me to comprehend that we've had a pandemic that forced restaurants to close. You, your study shows a $19 billion forced sales increase to third-party platform um, delivery companies, uh, which was a $50 billion overall year over year, correct? And they're still mm -hmm. operating at a net loss. Yeah, that's the, the final point is the one that uh, I'm not sure is correct. Uh, you know, they can claim uh, not being profitable, but uh, when I look to their financial statements that they file with the SEC, uh, DoorDash has been generating over $200 million of contribution profit every quarter, and they've been adjusted EBITDA positive uh, between $40 and $100 million per quarter, and this is after the, the fees were, were imposed. So I don't know necessarily that they're profitable in New York, but I would also say that uh, I have the geographic breakdown of their sales, and I estimate that over 10% of the category's uh, sales are in New York City. This is across the country, about 10 at least 10% of all the food sales that they do is coming from New York City. So if they're this profitable nationwide and New York is this big of a market, um, you know, putting two and two together, that would suggest to me that they, they've been profitable uh, in, in New York City. Thank you for that. Um, you, you have referenced DoorDash only. Have you... Have you, has your research indicated the other uh, platforms uh, are operating at a profit or loss? Yeah, in 2020, uh, Grubhub, you know, they, they filed with the SEC saying that they uh, generated uh, about $110 million worth of adjusted EBITDA profits. So you know, that was for, for the year as a whole. And um, it's not you know, front-end loaded. You know, they, they've been generating that sort of profit consistently throughout the year. Any other, any other provider? 
uh, those are the two big ones that I've been following publicly. So um, unfortunately, Uber Eats, they don't separately disclose because they're under the, the Uber umbrella. Uh, otherwise, I'd, I'd have figures for them as well. So does your study go into the impact that these caps have had and what it actually means for both the platform and the industry as a whole? Um, do you have a conclusion that you formulated? Uh, the main thing that we see is kind of the nationwide effect of the pandemic. And you know, to the extent that uh, we've continued to see dramatic growth in, in the revenues, which really has not slowed down at all, you know, that, that sort of uh, boost that they've gotten you know, off of what we would have estimated they would have done if we didn't have the pandemic, it really hasn't slowed. So, uh, so certainly, at least to the extent that that's true, it would imply to me that the caps have not had a dramatic effect on uh, gross food sales volume. <clears throat> and moving forward, as we come out of this pandemic and um, restaurants are open to full capacity limitations, the trends and the level of comfort before diners start frequent and, and enjoying indoor dining again, that swing will go back, but never back to where it was prior to pandemic as it becomes a consumer behavior now. It becomes not only a habit, but a demand. Yeah, we, we our figures would suggest that habituation is a reality and you know, that we've seen people when they start using delivery, they just tend to use it more and more and more. That actually was true even before the pandemic started. So to the extent that the pandemic has accelerated some of that, that business is not going to be going away. Uh, but certainly one of our big findings was we've seen this big substitution effect. And so if we do see people going back to, to on-premise dining again, you're only going to have one dinner. And so, you know, if, if it's on-premise, it's not going to be through, through a delivery app. So I think that I, don't, I, I wouldn't anticipate that we're going to go back to pre-pandemic levels, but I would anticipate that we are going to see kind of a, a reversion to, to something in the middle. Thank you so much. I'm grateful to you, and we're going to stay in touch as we continue to go through your submission and your uh, findings. Thank you. We're grateful for your time uh, that you've given us and for the research that you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Next, I'll be calling George Buono, followed by Ike Brannon, and then Andrew Ritchie. George? It's already time. My name is uh, George Buono. Uh, I space director of operations in the restaurant industry for over 40 years. I can say about delivery is it's 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 gone to a place where no one no one picks up the phone to place an order. No one uses your your personal website to place an order. Everything is done through these third party apps. I guess it's for some convenience purposes for the consumer. George, you're you're cutting in and out, and it's very difficult uh, to hear you. So you may want to bring the speaker a little closer to you because you're fading in and out. Is that any better? Much better. Okay, so I don't know how far uh, you to hear what I said. So I've been in the industry for over 40 years. Uh, the restaurant industry has changed dramatically in terms of delivery. Uh, it used to be where we would go to get phone calls for deliveries, uh, use our own personal websites for delivery. It's gone to the trend now where everybody just uses third party apps. On very small profit margins, typically 10 cents out of every dollar is um, towards our profit. And, um, you know, when we need the 35% uh, to be paid out to, to third party vendors, it basically leaves nothing left for us. You know, as you said, through the pandemic, you know, a lot of us were open serving guests without people being able to walk in, and we were paying commission to develop them and, and um, DoorDash and Uber. There was nothing left. We were basically working for free through the pandemic. So I, I hear you, George. I'm not sure if you can hear me well because your connection isn't uh, the greatest. During a pandemic, you're saying uh, even with the commission caps that were in place, you were not profitable on the third-party food delivery apps? 
just we, we had no walk-ins. Everything was ordered online. So even with the um, the uh, pandemic cap, we, we still we weren't making money. What do you think we should do to make sure that you continue to stay in business, George? Tell me your your what you would like this city council to do. Sure, I think there should be a, there should be a, a limit to how much they can uh, they can charge us for the third party app. Again, they they own eighty five percent of the market right now as far as online ordering is concerned. And delivery in general is concerned, and um, in order for us, to, I mean, we're basically serving them at this point. We're not really serving the guests because the guests are dealing with us directly. They're dealing with us through this third party app. So they're kind of like the middleman. I understand that they have to make money as well because I'm sure it costs them money, but it should be limited. George, that's why this hearing is so important and why it's ever more important that we hear from the restaurant operators um, as we figure out how we can um, help level the playing field to make sure that you stay in business and that the industry thrives uh, your testimony today is well noted, and we're grateful to you. Thank you, George. Thank you. Next, I'll be calling Ike Brannon, followed by Andrew Ridgey, and then Robert Bookman. Ike? Time will begin. Uh, so my name is Ike Brannon. I'm a, a senior fellow at a think tank called the uh, Jack Kemp Foundation. I've done a lot of research on uh, the gig economy, and I just wanted to share some of my uh, findings. Uh, there's a, a perspective that uh, during the pandemic, to help uh, restaurants, we had to cap uh, these fees that uh, food service uh, companies were, were charging, and that this is uh, somehow uh, the best of all possible worlds. And I submit that uh, this, this perspective is mistaken. Communities that have impose such caps, the response to the market has negated much of the intended impact. For instance, the frequently assessed cap has seen fit to add a flat fee between $1 to $3 to deliver to places like uh, Washington, D.C., where I live. The added fee charged in most markets, uh, where the cost of restaurants is cap, reduces demand for food delivery, and demand for food delivery falls in places where these fees are imposed. Uh, in such situations, as, as other uh, witnesses have already said, Platform companies uh, often reduce their service areas for restaurants as we make uh, delivery more economical. Uh, these caps also disrupt the fragile three sided food delivery service marketplace, resulting in fewer opportunities for work for delivery drivers and lower earnings for those who rely on this business for a sizable share of their income. Uh, that's the research that, that I've done. And it's a mistake to think that these caps help restaurants. Ephemerally increasing their net margins while reducing demand is not usually a trade off that benefits them. And they don't need a government to do this for them. They can increase prices on takeout foods on their own if they want. Uh, the main economic rationale we typically give for a price cap is that restaurants operate in some kind of monopsonistic market where they're the only, they only have one uh, buyer they can use, but there are multiple competitors in the food delivery market. Also, as it's been pointed out, restaurants aren't forced to participate in this market. They can decline to participate or do this on their own or contract with one or the other and play against each other. Um, restaurants have competing goals to stake here. They want to make sure that drivers are paid enough, restaurants aren't charged too much, and that consumers continue to frequent these establishments. These are all worthy goals. The idea of imposing a fee cap would have time has expired. Really, upon consumers being willing to pay more for delivery food. That's, that's it. Thank you. Mr. Brennan, did you submit written uh, testimony? Yeah. I'm sorry? Yes. Okay, because you're the connection. I did. Yes, I did. The connection isn't the greatest, and it wasn't very easy to hear all of that. Um, and we feel we were missing some key words there. But I look forward to reading a testimony and anticipation of, of that. I only have a few questions for you. During the pandemic, sure. um, you were obviously complying with the current caps, correct? So I'm, I'm an economist. I am not, uh, I don't, uh, I'm not a restaurant or a delivery. And so I'm just re referring to research I've done on the gig economy and how it's been impacted by such price caps.
Mr. Brandon, the connection is poor. So I, what I will, I look forward to reading your uh, testimony that you had submitted in writing, and, and I'm sure I'll follow up with you with the uh, questions. Is that okay? That would be perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ike. Next, we'll hear from Andrew Ritchie, followed by Robert Bookman, and then Josh Gold. Andrew? Your time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Andrew Ritchie. I am the executive director of the New York City Hospitality Alliance. We are a not-for-profit association that represents restaurants and nightlife establishments in the five boroughs. I submitted written testimony, but I will summarize that here. I just want to let you know there are many other restaurateurs that unfortunately couldn't stick around, but will probably submit written testimony as well. So let me be clear. Delivery is very important to restaurants, and it's quintessential to New York City. There's nothing inherently bad about delivery companies, but it's the unchecked market dynamics that creates an environment for certain billion dollar corporations to use their leverage to exploit New York City restaurants, workers, and consumers in order for them to stay competitive. Now, as you know, this exploitation began long before COVID-19 struck. And these companies, as you heard in testimony earlier, have only consolidated power throughout the pandemic. And now legislators must enact this package of common sense legislation to support the long term recovery ahead of us and the future of our industry and city. So first, we support making the per making permanent the critical fee cap on third party delivery fees that's set to expire. We cannot go to the 25, 30 plus percent fees where restaurants don't make money or they're even losing it by doing these deliveries, but they're not empowered to leave these platforms because they control the marketplace and they control the data. Mind you, there's another bill that would require third parties pass on the data of their customers to restaurants. I hear about unintended consequences, unintended consequences. What about the intended consequences of the unchecked market right now? for these few companies that hold so much power. If there was some unintended consequences, you could always go back and modify it. We know what we do know is that the current marketplace does not work. Second, we support prohibiting third-party companies from charging restaurants bogus fees for phone calls that don't result in orders. I mean, this is bonkers. The fact that we actually have that legislation to prohibit a company from charging a business a fee for services that were never rendered is kind of crazy, but we need it. Third, we support requiring third-party delivery companies to have a written agreement with restaurants before listing them on their site. Currently, they pull outdated menus without restaurants' permission. They post outdated menu prices, menu items that are no longer there. It creates tons of headaches for the restaurants. Obviously, for the workers, they go try to pick something up or place the order. It's not even there. Customers get angry. They blame the restaurants. Delivery workers are put in a bad place. That practice needs to stop. Fourth, we also support requiring full transparency to consumers about direct restaurant phone numbers and secondary phone numbers. Many of these third-party companies, they set up additional secondary numbers for the restaurants. They then use their sophisticated techniques to make those numbers appear ahead of the restaurant's direct number, and then they charge a fee. And we know what happens with these phone call orders. They are charging restaurant fees for phone call that don't result in an order. It needs to be stopped. Um, so in closing, I just wanna say that these bills are straightforward. We understand some may be addressing a bit more complex issues but you will continue to hear fear monitoring from opponents and those they've enlisted in an attempt to stop being regulated in any way, shape or form or fashion. We know they have a lot of money and we know that they also have questionable ways to fight policies that restrict it. Just like what we heard earlier from the representative from Grubhub, with all respect, saying the Latino Restaurant Association supports this and referencing quickly an article from San Francisco while I'm getting text messages and blowing up because the New York State Latino Restaurant Association strongly supports this is just one of many examples to show the extent that these companies will go to to exploit businesses. And like I said, I'm not saying that they're all bad. There just needs to be a more fair and equitable marketplace for the brick and mortar restaurants that we beloved, the hardworking workers, 
and the company. So we commend you, pardon for taking a little bit extra time, but we wanted to make sure that these voices were heard. We're happy to work with you and we wanna create a system that works for all parties. And we're happy to not only work with the workers, of course, but also the third parties. And Mr. Chair, I thank you for your leadership as well as the council, uh, member Moya and staff, and everyone else. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. So it sounds like the bills that you're hearing today would help the restaurant industry survive and hopefully thrive. Absolutely. These are common sense bills to create a more fair and equitable marketplace that will help restaurants, even if COVID didn't exist. As you know, these conversations have been going on for years, but now the long term restaurant recovery where we're still, you know, 130, 140,000 jobs short of where we were pre pandemic levels in our city's restaurants and bars. And we're also representing a 40% loss of all private sector jobs in New York City. So just because we're open at 100% occupancy means we're far away from recovering. Thousands and thousands of restaurants haven't received money through the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, which was expired. And we need this support, COVID or not. We need to create a more fair and equitable market, not just for them, but for all the different uh, so the current commission cap, in your opinion, has worked well during this pandemic? Yes, I think if you hear from most restaurateurs, 5% for being listed on the site, plus paying that credit card market fee, which it's, or credit card processing fee, which is not always clear if they're just passing it through or there's some additional assessment on top of that is appropriate. I think you heard from the uh, Grubhub representative that they were offering 10%. So then they increase, you know, to five. So maybe it shouldn't be 15%. Maybe it should be 10%. Uh, I know some other companies charge a flat rate. I mean, that's also the thing in this conversation, right? You know, it costs these companies outside of the credit card processing fee, which they're passing on, no more to process a $20 order or a $200 order. So the incremental increase, you know, of these percentages also doesn't really make sense. And when I went back to customer data and repeat customers, we know a lot of this business is not incremental sales. It's third parties using hundreds of millions of dollars in marketing and other types of technical sophistication to siphon off business that would have gone directly to restaurants in which they would have paid no fee or a much smaller fee through their platform. And it gets very detailed, I won't get into all of it, but even in Google ads, on the corner of the page for some ads, you'll see the restaurant's organic listing. But within that organic listing, you'll say something like support, you know, independent restaurants, uh, you know, order direct. And it's a Grubhub listing. So you think you're going to write to the restaurant, but then you click on it and it's siphoning off. And that's the same thing with the phone number. So, you know, it's complicated. I, I get it. But the cost of not doing anything greatly outweighs the attempt to bring a massive company or massive companies in a massive market into a regulatory framework. And that could be adjusted in the future, but we can't not do anything and we can't be scared. Um, these are massive markets. It, these companies are not leaving New York City. And frankly, if they do, we'll have other companies that come in and replace them. Thank you for that. You know, I want to point something out. We, uh, government has made an investment, in particular, the restaurant industry, by providing loans and grants during the COVID period. It's in our best interest that these businesses survive, thrive, and be, get to a level of profitability where they can pay back first the loans, and then in time, the grants uh, become profitable in the form of uh, contributions to the tax base in the city of New York. So it's a partnership that we have invested in and need to assure that they can continue to survive, to pay back the money. And I don't think that has been addressed at all during this hearing. Uh, and until you, um, your testimony, I, I wasn't even thinking in that fashion. Um, so we have a vested interest here. And it's Absolutely. It's all the economic activity that surrounds restaurants, it's not just restaurants, but it's, you know, where we purchase our food from, the eight upstate farmers and the whole entire economic ecosystem. And look, we're not bomb throwers. I get it. We've worked with DoorDash on giving grants to businesses. So the companies have capacity to do the right thing. 
but it is this unchecked market that makes it impossible for them to compete because it's kind of a, you know, a, a race to the bottom. And the last thing that I will just say is from Daniel McCarthy's uh, testimony earlier, that $19 billion that was transferred to the third party applications uh, is going to start coming back and has to on-premise dining. And these companies are going to do everything they possibly can to try to keep as much of that $19 billion as possible going to their companies. And if we don't cap them and do not regulate them now, it is going to be a rush to the bottom because they must do everything they can to show their investors and shareholders that they're turning a profit. It's the system. And the New York City Council has the opportunity to lead the nation and lead the globe in appropriately regulating these entities, it's, it, it's, 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 it's fair. Thank you, uh, Andrew. We'll stay in touch and I'm grateful to you. And I'm sure you submitted your testimony in writing as well. Thank you and keep up the good work. Thank you, Andrew. Next, I'll be calling Robert Bookman followed by Josh Gold and then Meyer Gall. Robert? Uh, your time will begin. Okay, this is unmuting me. Hi, I'm, I'm Rob. Th thank you, uh, Chairman Joe and I, Councilman Moy. I don't know if you're still around for your leadership on this issue. I'm Rob Bookman. I'm one of the founders and counsel to the New York City Hospitality Alliance, Andrews Group. And in my law practice, I represent hundreds of restaurant owners currently and thousands over the years. And my clients have been telling me throughout the pandemic that the, 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 the temporary laws that you passed were very useful and that these package of laws are desperately needed. Uh, to be adopted and made permanent um, so that they could continue uh, the slow comeback from COVID. Uh, this is the single most important package of bills you can do to save mom and pop restaurants in your neighborhoods. As Andrew said, this is a highly unregulated market and being a former counsel in the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs, I'm very familiar with government regulation and it's perfectly appropriate for the government to regulate a Wild West unregulated uh, market, which is what we have here in a very important industry. I disagree with uh, what the representative from DCWP said on a couple of situations. One is it's not unprecedented for that agency and for the city government to regulate business to business. But they regulate a number of business categories now, uh, you know, which are business to business categories. Um, and, and the city has for years, whether it be taxi, taxi medallions or whether it be um, commercial trade waste. So it's not unprecedented. You're allowed to regulate them. And I do believe that licensing would help and that licensing law would help because it creates a, a legal structure for all these other regulations. Um, so I disagree you know, with them on that. Also, we need to understand that this is consumer protection, these laws, because it's not just protecting small business, it's protecting consumers because this has to get paid for one way or the other. So there's either a higher cost to consumer directly or there's higher cost to consumers indirectly. But one way or another, if these businesses, these mega billion dollar businesses are unregulated, there's going to be higher costs, you know, both to consumers That's and expired. small businesses. Um, the Grubhub uh, representative uh, and the DoorDash both said that they didn't make a profit last year when uh, the economist said they clearly did. Uh, and understand when a, corpor a corporation's profit line doesn't include the $20 million that they pay, you know, their CEO, that goes to expenses. Uh, but in the real world, we understand that to be profits as well. Um, and of course, it's not, she said about 10 times, if, if a restaurant doesn't like their services, they can leave. Well, you can't leave when you own 70% of the market, which is what they own prior to uh, the COVID. And you can't leave when they own your customer data. They've got you over a barrel. So it's a one-way contract. And you, it's like the Hotel California from the Eagles. You can check in, but you can never check out. And so you need to pass these bills as well as the customer data bill, as well as the licensing bill. And if you do all of that together, you will be creating a level playing field where consumers and small businesses uh, can use these services, which they want to use, but we can use it in a way where everybody 
can survive and make a profit. Thank you. Robert, thank you, Robert. And thank you for uh, all of the hard work uh, that you've done during this prior to the pandemic and during the pandemic for this industry. It has been extremely important for us. I appreciate it, Chairman Joe. And I, one last thing I want to say about the phone calls, because it seems like the administration and others had a lot of angst over these phone calls and how do we charge it? You know, I got to say, you know, I don't know why they get any money for a phone call. If they're doing the delivery, they get paid for the delivery. And if they're not doing the delivery and I want to call my, you know, Bookman's Pizzeria, which I, which I love, and I go online like you did at the first hearing and you look for Bookman's Pizzeria and you get a phone number that they created. Uh, and so I call it thing. I'm thinking I'm calling Bookman Pizzeria. I don't know why they should get any money for that, to tell you the truth. And also the last thing I want to say is, you know, I'm a third party provider for restaurants as well. I'm a lawyer. I don't get to charge a percentage of what my client's revenue is or profits is. I charge a fee for a service. It's a flat fee or it's an hourly fee. Uh, the same thing with the food purveyors, the accountants, everybody. These guys have a model which they take a percentage of each order, even though the transmission of that costs them pennies, whether it's a $2 order or a $200 order. And now they're coming to you and saying, don't interfere with this crazy model that we created where somehow we are a percentage partner on the profit end of the restaurant, but not on all the expenses end. Maybe they should look to their model better, but if they're going to stick with this model, you have every right and obligation to regulate them. Robert, thank you. Um, and I'm sure you submitted a written uh, testimony as well. And I want to thank you for your patience. And I really want to follow up with you on uh, the OC uh, and the comment about not being able to enforce and um, Yes, of course. Of course they can. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Next, we'll be calling on Josh Gold, followed by Meyer Gall, and then Jeffrey Bank. Josh? The time will begin. Good morning. I'm Josh Gold from Uber Eats. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Uber Eats welcomes a continued conversation with the council on the topic of food delivery platforms. While we support three of the bills before you, I wanted to focus testimony today on the pricing control legislation that permanently fixes prices across the food delivery industry. First, let's not mistake commissions for profit. Commissions paid by restaurants are not profits for delivery platforms. These funds pay for things such as operating costs, insurance, marketing, customer support, and delivery worker pay, among other important parts of the business. The amount of commission charged to restaurant partners corresponds to service that restaurants choose to opt into. For example, a restaurant that uses their own couriers pays a lower commission than a restaurant accessing a courier through Uber. Since June 2020, when this cap was put into place, the cap has had a big impact. Uber Eats has lost more than $60 million in revenue in New York City due to the need to subsidize trips. Rarely do we see private businesses, business to business contracts subject to price controls. And in the rare case, namely public utilities or state of emergencies, it is to prevent price gouging and the contract is set to ensure that the utility is still able to gain a profit. Food delivery in New York City has evolved significantly over the last several years, and even as many see just a few delivery platforms as the participants in the industry, it's important to recognize that it's far more diverse. On the logistics only side or the delivery side, companies like Relay have established a substantial business to provide delivery in New York. And on the consumer facing side, many additional players exist from large companies like Toast and Chow Now to smaller competitors who have recently entered the market like Astoria Eats. We do, however, understand the council's desire to support our restaurant industry as it continues to face challenges to recover from the pandemic. With tourism and business travel still suffering and commercial offices unoccupied, a full recovery may seem temporary, temporarily elusive, and we understand that New York City restaurants may need a longer runway than other cities. To that end, we would encourage the council, council to explore extending the cap rather than making it permanent. The council has already extended the cap and nothing is stopping the spotty from doing that again if the situation warrants it. Alternatively, the council could look to other jurisdictions like Chicago, which will require third party platforms to offer at least one option at 15%. Thank you for your time. I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Josh. Um, you, I think you said $60 million was the loss during the pandemic based Correct. on the cap. Correct. And that's one year. Yes. I'm sorry. I was going to say to answer your question about cutting wages, which I know is uh, coming up there, um, we ate the $60 million instead of cutting the wages. I'm sorry. Repeat that one more. I think you're a little far from the speaker, and I'm not hearing you very well. 
Uh, I was saying the eight to sixty million dollars instead of cutting wages. I was I was asking your next question for you, having heard Amy and David. Okay. You saw increased sales, I'm sure, during a pandemic as being the only option for uh, food to get to uh, customers. What was the increase in uh, your overall gross sales that led to a sixty million dollar loss? Our increase uh, uh, Uber Eats wide um, was... Uber Eats wide? Uber Eats wide. I don't have New York City specific numbers I can get you that, but it was in the second quarter of 2020, uh, 2020 was 885, sorry, the increase in sales went from $6.9 billion to $12.4 billion in the most recent uh, quarter where the numbers have been reported to the SEC. 6.9 to 12 billion. Is that what I heard? Yes. Billion. 12 billion on sales on the restaurants, right? The restaurant takes the vast majority of that. For us, the, the amount of money we kept went from $885 million to $1.7 billion. But, and that's what percentage increase roughly over the year over year? Looks like a 100% increase year over year. 110% increase in gross sales and you're operating at a loss. Correct. And what was your level of profitability prior to that just from uh, Uber Eats? There was, we had not been profitable. Oh, so the, what was your net loss then? The quarterly loss in the most, the, the most recent public data was $200 million. Okay. The Q1 of 2021, for Q1 of 2020, it was $313 million. 313 million, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. So then actually you, the pandemic not only helped and the caps really helped the amount of uh, loss went from 300 million to 60 million. I'm looking at Q1 2020. I can go back a little further and find uh, uh, different numbers. D during but either way, it's not, a, either way, the point is that it's not a, currently uh, a profit-making business. All right. And I, I think many of our restaurants feel the same way now, uh, prior to pandemic and obviously uh, post-pandemic. Did you cut wages for delivery workers during a period in which the commission cap was in effect or were the wages consistent? No, as I said, we, we ate the $60 million. I, I'm sorry, I said that? We, we took it out from, we, we took the loss. But you didn't cut, the, did you cut the wages directly to delivery workers? No. Wages stood consistent? Correct. Thank you. Um, how much commission as a percentage did you charge restaurants um, for providing the delivery service before the commission cap was in effect? Before the commission cap, we had three all-in options, 0% for pickup orders, 15% uh, uh, for non uh, pickup orders where the restaurant performed the delivery themselves and 30% for all in. That included the credit card uh, commission fee and, and anything else prior to the pandemic. And during the pandemic, when the laws took effect, you were obviously charging 15% for delivery, 5% for listing, and then 2.5% um, was the credit card pass, pass through. What is the credit card fee? Two and a half percent. Two and a half percent. Yeah, some providers charge more, but we, we just have it at two and a half percent. So Amex is, uh, I'm sure the restaurant owners on the, on the call know Amex charges a little bit more. MasterCard user charge um, less than Amex, so we just went with the, the two and a half percent. If I may, is the two and a half percent a direct pass through, or do you mark that up at all? I believe it's a direct pass through. Direct pass through. Would you let me know uh, when you confirm that number? Yes. Can you, if 2359 becomes, becomes permanently extended, the existing commission, extend the existing commission caps, are there any other models that you like to suggest that we reduce commission fees for restaurants in lieu of a permanent cap? Yeah, I do think um, one thing to look at is what Chicago is contemplating doing, which is requiring third-party delivery apps to have a 15% option for delivery. 
And so on for restaurants who want to use a 15% option, that is a requirement that they are, they're going, they're contemplating having. And for those orders, we may have higher cost to consumers, or we may have a, a, a shorter uh, delivery radius. Um, and so that, that would make those uh, sustain that option sustainable. But the city of Chicago is contemplating having that as a requirement that we offer a 15% option, but that if other restaurants wanted to have a more premium package that had less cost for consumers or a larger delivery radius where their, where their uh, food can be delivered to uh, further away um, than with the 15% option that, that was, we are still able to enter into that agreement with restaurants. Thank you, Josh. Uh, how is the, the volume of orders placed changed since the governors reopened the restaurants at full capacity? Do you see a significant change at this point? I, I don't have that for you. I can get that for you today. That would be great. Um, and if you can compare it to the platforms to pre-pandemic, uh, during pandemic, would be a great I, great for us to fully understand what is happening to the industry uh, and the platforms. I get that for you, sir. Thank you. Stephanie, I'm not sure if there's anyone that has a question for Josh. No one has raised their hand on Zoom. Okay. No, I think we can move on whenever you're ready, Chair. Thank you, Josh. We'll stay in touch. Thank you, Dr. Mara. Thank you, Josh. Next, we'll be calling on Meyer Gall, followed by Jeffrey Bank, and then Kathleen Riley. Meyer? Your time will begin. It appears Meyer Gall is not present, um, so we will move on. Next, we'll be calling Jeffrey Bank, followed by Kathleen Riley and then Lisa Soren. Jeffrey? Time Thank you. Again. Thank you to the chairman and the committee for your support during this crisis. Many restaurants would not have survived without this legislation. Even the New York Times editorial board said, Third party apps, these delivery apps act like payday lenders with these high fees. Their publicly traded companies are acting like 800 pound gorillas crushing small business. But after all their predatory actions that allowed them to become monopolies, now let's use some of the words I just heard earlier. The seamless web uh, Grubhub representative said, we all have options. We don't have to use them, even though they clearly are monopoly. Why we need this legislation to be permanent, let's use some of the words we just heard. She said, we need these fees to pay Google for ads. We need these fees to pay Google for ads. So take the ads. When you go to Google right now, type in Carmine's, my restaurant that I own, and write Carmine's delivery, because you want to order from Carmine's. So why does she need fees from me to advertise so customers then go to Seamless Web so I can pay a higher fee for the customer who is looking for me? It's called direct search. They're very strong, these companies, in their marketing abilities. Again, I keep it simple. She needs fees, she said for Google ads. So Google Carmine's delivery, why does Seamless, Grubhub, DoorDash, and Postmates come up before my restaurant? My customer's looking for me. They don't want me to pay any fees. So they need more fees to charge me more money so they can advertise more to steal my own customers. It's crazy. Also a little genius. I'm obviously jealous. You then hear her say, we're fine with. They're always fine when they get caught. They're fine and they fix the phone problem. When they got caught with the phone number charging for, for fraudulent and, and non-orders, they're fine with that being corrected. They were fine stopping the fake websites that they did for years, trying to trick customers into fake websites to go to, to restaurants. That was okay. They're fine that now you don't have to be listed with them if you don't want to be. And now this new engine, this new scam, we're going to give a free storefront, I think DoorDash called it, so people can order directly. Yet they're advertising to direct them back to their own to their own websites. I'm as expired. These companies are just not, they've shown not been legitimate partners. American Express charges all restaurants the same fees. I think this company should look into another word that she said. She said the reps decide what people pay. It might be interesting for you to look into Grubhub and see, are they charging the same fees in different neighborhoods or races? Is there discrimination going on? Amex charges us all the same fees. I don't know why Seamless and Grubhub let their reps charge whatever fees they want. But whatever you decide, the most important thing I beg of you, 
make them make their fees be transparent on the bills. That's it. At the end of the day, 5%, this percent, that percent, let customers know how much they're actually charging. Let there be transparency. Thank you for the time. I mean, thank you. And while you were uh, sharing with us, when you Google your name, you're absolutely right. It's one, two, three, four platforms come up before your um, website. And, and here's the irony, Chairman. I paid for those ads and higher fees. I have to be a moron. That, <laughs> That's what happened. Uh, Carmen, do you have written agreements with the uh, platforms? There are contracts, yes. They are, they are very contentious and unnegotiable. Right, so then the contracts that you have uh, also call for that service that your restaurant be listed um, at a certain priority, correct? No, we're not under priority listing. We had in the contract originally, they had the right to put in fake websites, but then your legislation made them take that out. The contract had that they could, you know, jump the phone numbers. Your legislation took that out. This is another step along the way that you guys will pass legislation and they'll say, oh, we'll take out direct search. They know what they're doing. This isn't about a marketplace trying to get me new customers. This is about them taking my own customers and then being geniuses and charging me higher fees so they can take my own customer. Because they could easily stop doing this if they wanted to. They know what they're doing. Come on, I know that you, you're involved for quite some time in the, uh, you're a legend in the uh, industry. <laughs> During this pandemic, which I think no one in their wildest dreams ever imagined could put our businesses in the position that they are, what did these commission caps and temporary measures do for your business? Can you tell me what it actually meant? Are you at a level of profitability now or not during a pandemic, post pandemic? Pro profitability will come maybe 22. Everybody likes to forget that for 15 months, we've been working with capacity limits and three hands tied behind our back. Just because we're at 100% capacity, no one's at profitability. People are digging themselves out of a 15 month hole. But the caps helped us survive, okay? Because what happened? The government shut down the world. The government asked everyone to quarantine. Let's remember, nobody even knew what a quarantine meant. What was going to happen during those two weeks back in March? You, people were afraid, but they asked restaurants to stay open and serve the people so they could sit at home and be quarantined. So employees came to work, didn't know, should we wear a mask, not a mask? This is a long time ago. And our employees went out of their way to help survive. We weren't making any money. We were losing a ton of money. And then, God forbid, everyone went to apps. So without those fees, we would have been crushed. Putting in the restriction of fees actually let us get a fighting chance to maybe survive. Then the government grants and PPP gave us another lifeline. We've been on a branch, on a branch, on a branch the whole way. And now that we're at 100% capacity, everyone's under the delusion because the restaurant has a line at six o'clock at night that we're all fine. Nobody's fine. I'm in a better little bit of position than most. We've been around 30 years. But the reason I do these things and I sat on hold here for five hours is because mom and pops can't fight like this. And some of the mom and pops don't even understand the manipulation that they're getting themselves into where they're getting this little crack taste from these third-party apps. They're advertising my name delivery $5 off free to steal my customer, to put them into their ecosystem and then charge me more fees and complain to you that it's not enough fees, Chairman. We need more fees, as she said, because we need more ads so we can keep screwing these guys over. It's almost comical. I'm using their words, not mine. What would you like to see done if you had to list your priorities, where we are now and knowing what we're coming out of? Well, all these bills are equally important. Three of the bills fix past problems and the, and the fee cap fixes the future problem. Please do not go back to this free, free for all fee structure. It's crazy. They are an 800 pound gorilla in New York City. It is unheard of. I'm not going to compare myself to the rest of the country. In New York City, Everyone uses Seamless or Grubhub or whatever it's called this week, okay? And allowing them to charge whatever they want or now say, so just leave if you don't like it is ridiculous. It's, un it's unpossible. They know what they're doing with this direct search scam. They knew what they did with the phone fees. They knew what they did with the websites. They knew what they did with listing restaurants that didn't want to be listed. Now they have this new engine. Oh, we'll allow our, our restaurant tours to have their own engine. 
but we're going to advertise over it so it's moot anyways. They're, 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 they're marketing geniuses. My hat's off. Maybe after, you know, someone puts them out of business, they'll all come work for me and I could get my restaurants going. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sir. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling Kathleen Riley, followed by Lisa Soren, and then Lee Jacobs. Kathleen? The time will begin. Hello everyone, um, good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Riley with the New York State Restaurant Association and thank you so much for having me today. The pandemic has exacerbated so many dynamics in the restaurant industry and yet we keep coming back to the relationship between restaurants and food delivery platforms. I wanna take the time to thank council members Joni and Moya for keeping this relationship on their minds before, during and after the height of the pandemic. Thankfully, New York City Council did take the responsible step last spring to set some boundaries on the fee structures that the delivery platforms could charge, which corrected the uh, relationship imbalance, at least temporarily. But today, City Council is taking the bold opportunity to consider making the fee caps permanent, and we are fully supportive of this move. While intro 2359, which creates the permanent fee caps, is the centerpiece of the hearing in our minds, it's important to remember the larger context for these caps, which is the relationship between the platforms and the restaurants. The other intros being considered today touch upon several of these points. 2333 prohibits platforms from listing restaurants without their consent, a practice which has landed many of these platforms in lawsuits around the country, but has still not been banned here in New York. Intro 2335 provides oversight and customer transparency about phone numbers listed on third party platforms and clearly marks phone numbers that are hosted by the third parties and also requires a direct phone number to be listed. And finally, intro 2356 would make the ban on the phony phone charges permanent. Baffling the law needed to be passed in the first place, but exploitative practices by these platforms made it a necessity. The lived experience of restaurant operators and their important testimony at this hearing and in hearings past make it clear that third-party delivery platforms have been finding ways to take advantage of their role in the restaurant ecosystem, sometimes around the margins, sometimes front and center. Thankfully, City Council has not lost focus on this sector, and they've taken the opportunity to learn more about the dynamics at play and introduce legislation to solve problem after problem that has come to light. Today's hearing marks an important turning point because it strives to address new ills that we haven't addressed before, but also because city council has I'm given the restaurant expired. community a platform to say exploitative behavior is wrong during the height of a pandemic, during the long, slow recovery from a pandemic, and actually always. And if it took a pandemic for some of this exploitation to come to light, the least we can do for a beleaguered restaurant industry is not forget what we learned or begin to ex excuse exploitation moving forward. I wanted to quickly address something that a couple things that were said earlier in the hearing. Um, I was also already planning to address this, uh, this ask, but it did already come up from the platforms. All over the state in localities where uh, NYSER has been working with localities for passing fee caps and at the state legislature, the third party platforms advocated for an amendment that amounts to a huge loophole. Um, they're asking to allow for often additional marketing services to restaurants for an additional percentage charge above the fees. I'm sure it's intuitive to the committee, but it basically allows the platforms to circumvent the caps altogether, dropping service levels or visibility of restaurants who don't opt in to bare bones or non-existent, and then requiring them to pay extra to regain what they lost. We have not heard from a single member that they wish they were paying more to the platforms. And the platforms like to frame it as beneficial to restaurants, restaurants choice, but please do not take their word for it. Intro 2359 offers strong fee cap protections as written, and any opportunity for them to charge more will fully undermine that. I also wanted to point out that much earlier in the, in the hearing, I think I heard um, Mr. Klausner suggest that under the current laws, two identical platforms, one who offers delivery and one who doesn't would be unequally covered by this law, um, which does not appear to be correct based on how the law is written because it defines the delivery platforms as offering same day delivery or pickup. So, whether or not you offer or regularly use the delivery um, mechanism is not important. Delivery and pickup are both covered. And I think that we all know that straight up marketing companies, some marketing consultant, that was never the target of these laws. We all know that it's about the platforms that have become critical marketplaces for ordering food. And they all deserve to be regulated by this law and all are covered by this law. Thank you so much for the time this afternoon. I'm sorry for going over my two minutes. Um, and happy to answer any questions or follow up after the fact. Thank you, Thank you Kathleen. I'm sure you submitted your testimony in writing as well. 
Mm -hmm. Short, what would you like to see done moving forward? We'd like to see this whole package pass. Um, we also, it was mentioned by a few other people, but the legislation about uh, having your customer data that, that for orders placed through third parties, we'd really like to see that passed as well. Thank you, Kathleen. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling Lisa Soren, followed by Lee Jacobs, and then Ryan Naples. Lisa? Time begins. Thank you, sorry for that. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Joe Knight and members of the New York City Council Committee on Small Business. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Lisa Sarn, President of the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, a business service organization representing over 23,000 Bronx businesses, ranging from micro and small businesses to large industry employers. I am concerned and express our, our organization's opposition to the third party permanent delivery cap legislation being discussed today. I know our organization's opposition runs counter to many of my colleagues. However, we cannot continue to overstep and over legislate business without a proper understanding of unintended consequences. Our organization does believe that smart amendments to this legislation could make it much better. But as it is written, it opens the door for future regulatory actions on businesses and establishes a slippery slope for future council actions that will deeply impact a biz the business ability to operate in New York City. During the pandemic, the closure of businesses in, and the closures of businesses that came to light the exorbitant prices that were being charged to our restaurants and food establishments by third party delivery services. I represent many food establishments that reached out with concerns of pricing and loss of income due to these prices. I believe these companies were taking advantage of these businesses during the worst times in our city's most recent memory. I applaud this committee, especially Chair Joni, for the foresight in re researching this issue thoroughly and doing something about it. Temporary capping of the fees made sense. It reduced the cost to our food establishments allowing room for profit or at a minimum, they were able to break even. I believe the right way to do this would be to extend the temporary cap and work with this industry on their business models that make sense for everyone. This council must bring business to the table and negotiate in good faith. Mandating price caps of private industry is a very slippery slope. If this bill goes through, what is to stop the members from going through a list of private businesses and determining what they should and should not charge. Allowing this bill to go through is another notice that New York City remains anti-business, that the city will mandate how businesses run and what prices, pricing businesses can charge. A better solution, let us revisit how this delivery industry does business, look closely at what the regulations, if any, need to be put in place to protect that our mom and pop micro businesses, not mandate what they can and cannot charge. This city already has mandated how businesses can schedule their employees, who they can and cannot fire, how much time we can give our employees off. In addition of all, all the more regulations and the outrageous amount of paperwork that is mandated by city agencies is a death knell to businesses which want to operate. This city has established itself as being anti-business with regulatory actions and an anemic pandemic response. The legislation today is another example of just that. With respect to all you do to support our micro businesses, which my members and businesses across my borough appreciate, where do we draw the line? What industry is next? I stand ready as do my members to work with you and determine how best to move forward on this issue. It worked during the pandemic and can help during recovery, but let us really talk about reasonable next steps maybe provide monies towards marketing and education for our small businesses. Many of our immigrant businesses may not understand their choices as it relates to this specific service. We must learn from our recent and long-term history. We lost the Amazon headquarters to a huge, a huge job creator because our representatives at city state levels determined what was in the best interest of our businesses and community. It became a short-term solution, yet Amazon moved into Manhattan 
opened many warehouses employing hundreds if not thousands of people at minimum wage and we lost the opportunity for new schools high tech job training and so forth let us learn from these mistakes let us take step a step back and bring the right businesses to the table and figure out what will work best without putting our foot down and telling businesses how to do business thank you and i'll take any questions you may have I want to thank you, Lisa. And uh, did you submit your testimony in writing as well? I did. Lisa, in a perfect world, um, I agree that less government intervention in business um, and in marketplace is the ideal scenario. But we currently have government regulating real estate, energy, utilities, commercial carding, brokers' fees um taxi limousine and this is just to name a few of the areas we regulate because government also has a responsibility to protect consumers and in this regard the reason we were looking into the caps and why they took place is because there was a need to protect a very vital industry to the city they're so vital that government actually invested in restaurants through loans and grants. That's your taxpayer dollars. That's New Yorkers tax dollars. Aren't we supposed to be in a position to make sure that industry can survive to pay back those loans? That in, in time, those grants get paid back through the taxes they generate? making the taxpayer whole and the investment that we made in them. You've heard the testimony on the, the cap restaurants are breaking even at best, at best. The, the numbers in the forecast that we have on profitability on sales show a net loss for every transaction. I don't want more government regulation, but I also know that if government doesn't intervene, this consumer demand of third party platform is not going away. It's going to increase. And as it increases, it's going to have a bigger impact on that particular establishment, the restaurant industry as a whole. And we need to make sure that they stay, that they're in business. They are a very important part of our culture. They're very important to New York from a tax base and from an employment base. So I hear your concerns. Um, I just, and that's why this hearing is so important. We get to hear from stakeholders, not only the platforms, but the actual restaurants. We get to hear what the issues are. And you know as well as I do, if you're a partner, that means we both have to benefit. It can't be one-sided. I don't know how you want to answer that. <laughs> Allow me to say this. I, the role of our representatives is to protect the consumers. I am all in on that in partnership. And our restaurants are without a doubt a, the backbone of the majority of the work of the services provided. Um, I, I visit them almost on a daily basis. But I will say this, yes, taxpayer dollars pay for loans and all other items. And we, I could probably get into the very specific of how this restaurant revitalization loan basically screwed over our restaurants because of the minimal amount of restaurants that received it. But I can also say that the tax dollars and the amount of regulations that this city puts upon our restaurants, if that, if that um, body of legislation on top of our, our restaurants weren't as hard as they are by our city government right now, there would probably be more room for negotiations with companies like these third parties. And please don't get it confused. It's not a matter of me supporting the companies one way or another. This is a discussion about at what point do our legislators realize that not everything can be regulated. And if that's the tone we're gonna take with companies wanting to do business with companies, then we also have to look at how the city agencies 
in New York deal with our businesses. Because if we were to put dollar to dollar, I can almost guarantee you that the amount of regulations, violations being received by our businesses, even during COVID, outweighs what these businesses are earning. So I think it's a matter of looking in the mirror with all due respect, Chairman, and I get where you're coming from. Um, listen, I oversee businesses and some of them are probably really upset with me right now, but the long-term solution is more about conversation and not rushing through these bills. I mean, look at the vendor one. The vendor one went through. I'm all about business, but they're overtaking our streets and everything else. Why don't we focus on what can bring a better access quality of life business to the businesses we are here to support? And the, right now they need us on the, on the quality of life. Let's regulate what really needs regulation. And let's, let's allow people to come back and eat at restaurants, shop, come into our city, come into our borough and enjoy without having to step over vendors or businesses worrying about keeping their doors open because they'll get a violation for air conditioning escaping from their doors. Lisa, it sounds like you want us to regulate government from regulating, and I agree with you. We'll talk more <laughs> about this. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the committee. Thank you. Next, we will be calling Lee Jacobs, followed by Ryan Naples, and then Michael Fuquay. Lee? Time begins. Good afternoon, Chair Jonai and members of the Committee on Small Business. My name is Lee Jacobs. I am a partner at the law firm of Helbron Levy, a full service New York City law firm focused on the needs of the hospitality industry. I'm advocating on behalf of additional protection for the hospitality industry against multi-billion dollar tech giants seeking to add wealth at the expense of small businesses and restaurants. Our firm primarily represents members of the hospitality industry with their real estate, corporate litigation, employment, and licensing needs. We recently initiated a lawsuit in the Southern District of New York against the largest third-party delivery service companies that predominantly service New the New York City hospitality industry. Grubhub, which also owns and operates Seamless, Uber, which also owns and operates Uber Eats and Postmates, and DoorDash, which also owns and operates Caviar for violations of the local laws that are under consideration for today for renewal. Now, as it's been discussed, it's been no secret that the COVID-19 pandemic disproportionately affected the restaurant and hospitality industry. New York City restaurants were forced to fight for their existence and reported massive layoffs and, and dips in revenue as a result of the pandemic. And they were forced to use third-party delivery platforms. As a reminder, the third-party third party, third party delivery platforms are just another vendor to our, my restaurant clients. But unlike other vendors, such as food purveyors, linen companies, security companies, this is the only vendor which makes money on both sides of the transaction. Both the consumer and the restaurant pays these third-party companies for their, these services. And it's through those payments that we are believe that massive profits were made by these companies in violation of the local law. And I'm happy to discuss with, uh, with the committee what we believe those violations are of the local law, as well as what uh, further needs I'm are inspired. needed um, through the renewal of these laws. And happy to take any questions if, uh, if, if there are any. Thank you so much for your testimony, Lee. Next, we'll be calling Ryan Naples, followed by Michael Fuque, and then Andrea Kutsudakis. Ryan? Your time will begin. Hi, thank you for that. Um, good afternoon, Chair Joan and I, members of the committee. I'm Ryan Naples, Deputy Director at Tech NYC. We are an advocacy group for New York's tech community representing more than 800 companies and organizations. Food delivery in New York is not just a luxury enjoyed by the affluent, but an important service for people from all walks of life. During the pandemic, in fact, it was a crucial lifeline for many people who lacked food access. This is why we support legislation that helps customers ordering food and New York City restaurants thrive. Unfortunately, we cannot support making permanent the 20% delivery fee cap previously enacted because of now expired limits on restaurant capacity. Instituting an artificial price cap will raise prices for customers ordering food as a result, and as a result will reduce the amount that customers order over time. 
Increased food prices may not be a concern to high income families in gentrified neighborhoods, but it'll have an effect on the ability of lower income New Yorkers to access food from home. The fee cap is also attempting a silver bullet solution to a complex problem that is greatly affected by many issues such as commercial rent, increasing, increasing labor costs, and city fines and penalties. It is unfortunate that de delivery platform fees, which are relatively minor compared to the cost of labor, rent, and city fines, may be capped while no efforts exist to address these problems. We encourage you to consider the origin of the proposed 20% fee cap, which is not tied directly to any economic justification and is entirely arbitrary. Given this reality, this cap will not enable more restaurants to survive, which is an important goal that we support. Instead, this short-sighted solution will make ordering food more expensive for New Yorkers, which will lead to an even greater contraction of the food delivery market. As many restaurants will readily admit, maintaining their own delivery operations and delivery staff is too complicated and expensive for individual establishments. Unfortunately, making the existing cap permanent will negatively impact delivery platforms' ability to provide these services. Our members are not uniform in size and scale, and there is real competition in this market. Some of our members will not be able to survive the commission cap, and two notable mergers in this industry have already occurred. Fewer delivery network companies. Um, can I finish up? It'll be like 10, 20 more seconds. I, I apologize. Uh, go ahead, finish up if it's quick. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. So, fewer delivery network companies will severely limit the broad range of services and fee structures made available to restaurants from different delivery platforms. We know that at the federal level, a robust social safety net and access to more affordable capital would make a significant difference for restaurants, while at the state level, commercial rent control would actually reverse the trend of New York City's decade-long increase in the high turnover rate of restaurants of all sizes, up to 80% over uh, the course of five years. Unfortunately, we also know that these structural changes are unlikely to occur anytime soon. These are the real solutions we hope that we at Tech NYC can work on with you in the short term instead of this mis misguided one. Thank you for consideration. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling Michael Fuque, followed by Andrea Kutsudakis, and then John McCarthy. Michael? Good time, we'll begin. Thank you. My name is Michael Fuque. I'm co-owner of the Queensboro in Jackson Heights. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. Prior to COVID, our restaurant worked with Grubhub and Caviar. In March 2020, we cut the cord and fired the delivery apps. Takeout and delivery became our entire business, and we could not afford to pay anyone 30% of our revenues. We pivoted to taking takeout and delivery through our own website and used our own staff to make deliveries. This was a key to our business and our employees surviving the pandemic. Despite ending our relationship with the delivery apps, they continued to list us on their websites. We've asked to be removed and our requests have been ignored. The apps collect orders and call us as if they are the end user. We only find out the source when the app driver arrives for pickup. Why is this a problem for us? One of the Queensboro's many pivots during the pandemic was to revamp our menu and pricing to meet the needs of our neighborhood. However, if you go on the delivery apps, you will find menus and prices from before the pandemic. This poses a problem. We frequently get calls for menu items that we no longer produce or complaints about prices not matching online. Because we have no way to directly contact these consumers, we have no way to repair the damage done to our reputation. The delivery apps are presenting us to the public as if we are their partner. In truth, they have pirated our menu without consent. What's more, they're presenting us falsely to the public and doing significant damage to our reputation in the process. I wanna reiterate something that's come up over and over. These are not companies that act in good faith. They are predatory and parasitic. We will never do business with them again because they have proven to be an untrustworthy partner. I salute the committee for taking up these issues. Thank you for your time and energy. Thank you, Michael. Next we'll be calling Andrea Kutsudakis followed by John McCarthy and then James Malios. Andrea? The time will begin. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andres Kutsudakis. Um, I'm also an attorney for dozens of restaurants. I have a restaurant in Tribeca that I've recently taken over. And I'm also the president of the Greenwich Village Chelsea Chamber of Commerce. 
Um, I, I've been on this hearing all day and it's uh, insane to hear some of the things, but I think there's some clarity that's needed. Um, there's a big difference between a fee based on the value of the user experience, a fee based on additional or enhanced marketing and a fee based on the value of delivering the food for the restaurants instead of the restaurant doing it themselves. All of those things are great. The problem here and the reason why fee cap is absolutely necessary is because there is no way restaurants can compete with these platforms. When they do not provide the customer data, they create secondary websites, secondary phone numbers, and spend substantial money, God knows how much, for Google ads, Super Bowl ads, et cetera, to not only drive customers to their platform, which would otherwise be perfectly okay, but to drive them away from the so-called restaurant partners that they list on their platform. Websites that these restaurants have created to maintain an online presence and compete against these platforms, and I'm going to do it myself. All the testimony regarding a loss by these companies, even with the billions in revenue, it sounds crazy. We're, we're suffering a loss. We made $4 billion last year, but we lost X. Yeah, that's because you're spending all your profits on marketing money and advertisements to drive the business away from the restaurants. Once those restaurants are out of business, the profits will magically appear in massive amounts. So... You know, th th this concept of, uh, you know, anti-business, uh, anti-business legislation, it's only anti-business if you're pro-big business, and it's pro-business if you're pro-small business. Um, at the end of the day, the main takeaway here is, in the perfect universe, these platforms would love every single bite of food any person in our city takes to happen, not at a restaurant, but at home or at work, and ordered through their platform. So there is no scenario where Time is expired. there is no scenario where they would like anyone to not buy from their platform. They don't support our communities. And, you know, it's in closing, I'll just cut right to it. You know, we I absolutely wholeheartedly support this legislation in its entirety. And I really urge the city council to send a clear message to all of these technology companies, not just these uh, third party platforms. You're welcome to do business in our great city, but not with free reign. If that's the market you need to succeed, this is not the city for you. Your business model must support our communities and it must be aligned with our values and our principles. We will not allow big tech business models to not only dictate what our communities look like, and they certainly will not eliminate our small business. Our restaurants matter to us, hospitality matters to us. You Thank must you, Andrea. Thank you. Next, I'll be calling John McCarthy, followed by James Malios, and then Sam Pierre. John? Your time will begin. Uh, my name is John McCarthy. I'm an advisor to the New York Japanese Restaurant Association. Uh, the NYJRA was founded as a nonprofit 501c6 at the outset of the pandemic to represent the interests of the Japanese restaurant owners and operators, among other business uh, owners. Um, I appear today to, to urge support and, and passage of all of these bills, this entire package of bills. These bills are not only vital to the continued recovery of an industry that's been disproportionately and adversely affected by the pandemic, but they also correct egregious wrongs uh, to these businesses that were brought to light uh, during the lockdowns. Uh, to give the uh, committee context, the Japanese restaurant community has lost as many restaurants during the pandemic as were created and opened in New York City from the year 2000 to the present. That's a loss of 20 years of progress and job creation. Uh, the nefarious and unscrupulous business practices of these, uh, some of these vendors uh, has been a burden on businesses and restaurants for some time. Uh, I ask that the committee consider that many of these small businesses that are targeted by these vendors are ones that are owned by minorities and in the case of the NYJRA, Asians and Asian Americans. In some instances, those without a solid understanding of English or their rights are being taken advantage of by these vendors. I point to the testimony regarding uh, take it or leave it contracts. I take it, point to the testimony of um, uh, not having uh, full disclosure of fees and arrangements on websites. Um, they are left to the uh, potentially unscrupulous behavior of account executives and others. Uh, thus, it is left to uh, this committee uh, to uh, institute the protections that these uh, businesses so desperately need. I've heard a lot uh, about the um, other, other portions in, of the package, but focusing on the delivery fees, I have not heard any creative ideas from the actual third-party vendors as to a solution for the situation. 
uh, other than that they want to raise uh, the fees on restaurants who cannot sustain this model. They are looking to the restaurants to support their business model instead of looking for other creative ways. These are the best and brightest Thank hotels, you. but we need some relief and these bills are for uh, the relief and survival, not thrive. They're not gonna thrive under it, but their Thank survival you. depends on these bills. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, I'll be calling James Malios, followed by Sam Pierre and then Josh Morgan. James? Your time will begin. Mute me, please. Uh, hi. Just to be clear, I have one minute, correct? Or two minutes, please. You have two minutes. Thank you. All time now. So my name is James Bios. I own three restaurants in the New York City area. I'm also a member of the New York City Hospitality Council, among other boards. First, make no mistake and don't believe the BS that you heard from Grubhub and the other companies earlier. Last year, in 2019, end of 2019, when they released their fourth quarter earnings, Grubhub conceded that their model cannot make money, their model loses money, uh, and they had really no hopes to ever be profitable. Nevertheless, even when you reduced their fees this last year, they doubled their revenue uh, this past last quarter in 2020, but yet still true to their prediction, lost money. They don't operate like the brick and mortar businesses that exist in New York City. Second, all we are asking with restaurants with liquor licenses is asking you, the city council, to enforce the state law that is on the books now. That if someone who has 10% revenue, in excess of 10% revenue from our restaurants, has to be listed on the license. That is the law. We are, because the state has not stepped in so far, we are asking our local city council to step in and enforce the state law as it is written with the SLA. Third, what you have seen since, the, since this law has passed is that every one of these companies has now instituted a delivery fee, a service fee, a gratuity fee. So if you allow them to go back to the previous usurious 30% charges that they were instituting, I have, will be gobsmacked that they would actually give up those other fees that they've now instituted to subvert the legislation that the council already passed to date. You already know about the importance of, of restaurants in this community. I don't need to repeat it. But for God's sakes, don't believe the load of bullshit that they're selling you from, the, from their lobbyists, please. Thank you for your testimony, James. Next, I'll be calling Sam Pierre, followed by Josh Morgan, and then Rachel Mulcahy. Sam? Your time will begin. I don't believe Sam is present, so I'll be moving on to the next panelist. Next, we'll be calling Josh Morgan, followed by Rachel Mukhegi, and then Samira Alansari. Josh? Your time will begin. I don't believe Josh is present at this time either, so we will move on to the next panelist. The next panelist is Rachel Mulcahy, followed by Samira Alansari, and then Carlos Ignacio. Rachel? Your time will begin. I don't see Rachel present at the hearing at this time. So next we'll be calling Samira Alansari followed by Carlos Ignacio and then Paul Folletti. Samira? Your time will begin. Samira appears to not be present, so I will move on to Carlos Ignacio, followed by Paul Folletti and then Deshay Grant. Carlos? Your time will begin. I don't believe Carlos is present. So next we'll be calling Paul Folletti, followed by Deshay Grant and then Alberto Miranda. Paul? Your time will begin.
Okay, I don't believe Paul is present. So next up is Deshay Grant, followed by Alberto Miranda, and then John Olson. Deshay? The time will begin. I believe Deshay is not present. So next up is Alberto Miranda, followed by John Olson, and then Montana, Montana Williams. Alberto? The time will begin. Alberto appears to not be present. So next we will be calling John Olson, followed by Montana Williams and then Spiros Kasimis. John? Your time will begin. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair John I and members of the Small Business Committee. My name is John Olson. I'm the Northeast Director for the Internet Association, or IA. IA is the only trade association that exclusively represents leading global internet companies on matters of public policy. Our mission is to foster innovation, promote economic growth, and empower people through the free and open internet. We believe the internet creates unprecedented benefits for society, and as the voice of the world's leading internet companies, IA works to ensure legislators, consumers, and other stakeholders can understand these benefits. I'm here to speak on Introduction 2359 today. IA is opposed to, permanent, to any permanent cap on third-party delivery commissions. Delivery network companies have been financially subsidizing restaurant delivery services throughout the pandemic. Understanding we as a society were collectively living in an extraordinary times, and taking the steps to ensure the survival of restaurant operators, platforms operated under the financial restraints of the temporary cap tied to the emergency order for over a year. Now with Governor, officially, now Governor Cuomo officially declaring the end to the, the state of the emergency in New York, the temporary cap on commissions should be allowed to sunset and platforms and their partners should, be, <clears throat> should return the contractual obligations that have been agreed upon. It is both inappropriate and unnecessary for legislation to dictate business-to-business -business contracts by imposing a fixed price. Restaurants have a choice of whether they want to offer delivery themselves or partner with a delivery network company. Deliver delivery network companies are competing for restaurants' businesses and offer a wide range of partnerships, structures, and commission rates to suit restaurants' needs. Commission fee structures are transparent and clear when any restaurant enters a contractual partnership with a delivery network company. Regulating these contract terms is tantamount to government intervention requiring wholesalers to sell their goods at a loss. It's important to understand that commissions are not profit for delivery platforms. Agreed upon rates with restaurants are based on a broad range of services made available to restaurants through our members' platforms. They are not one size fits all, but rather are tailored to each restaurant's needs. Restaurants can collaborate on marketing collateral, determine the appropriate neighborhoods to open new locations, and even see how pricing affects consumer demand. Commission and fees go a long way towards supporting delivery platforms operational costs, ensuring workers are paid fairly, and allowing them to provide the reliable and safe service that residents expect and rely upon, especially in times of need like today. For these reasons, I strongly urge the committee not to advance this legislation. I thank you for your time, and I will take any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Please tell me again, you're affiliated with who? Uh, I'm the regional director for the Internet Association. We are a trade association representing a number of internet companies, including the ones that uh, provided a testimony earlier today. Thank you. So, John, I, I, and I understand what you're saying, that government intervention is not a good thing. Uh, regulation of markets is very complicated. But here we have an industry that is barely holding on, and I believe the numbers are, they are 70% off their gross revenues. They're operating at a loss. We've done everything that we possibly can, and that is at a city, state, and federal level, to invest in this industry to make sure that they survive this. We're not even referring to thriving. Surviving was the end game during the pandemic. They're not there yet. They're operating at net losses. You don't think government has a responsibility to ensure an industry like the restaurant industry survive? Um, that not only does it get through this pandemic, but because it's such a vital part of this city from employment, tax base, uh, and a part of the very culture of what makes New York City so great, the different cuisines. And I'm probably the most pro-business 
council member in this council, and even I say there must be some government intervention to make sure that no industry gets wiped out. See, what you're failing to recognize, John, and it was mentioned during one of the testimonies, it's not only the commission caps, but actually the data that these third-party platforms are obtaining on their partnership through these restaurants and what they're doing with that information. Ghost kitchens. There is nothing that prevents a third-party platform, and some of them are already doing it, from taking the data from the restaurants, using that to build a ghost kitchen to compete with the very restaurant that was paying a fee to them for a service. It's much more complicated than government regulation. This is hijacking of a business. There isn't a business out there that would want to pay for a service. I mean, hell, if we could, these restaurants would even stop taking credit cards because they don't want to pay the 3% to the credit card for the credit card transaction. That comes out of the bottom line. It gets passed on to the customer one way, one form or another. But 30%, and because you're very knowledgeable, as far as you're aware, what is the level of profit on a fast food establishment as an industry? Are you asking me? Yeah, I, I mean, believe you, you quoted six to nine percent. Um, right. But respectfully, Councilman, um, this isn't just about third party delivery services and the commissions they, you know, they charge. This is about the rents that restaurants are currently paying. It's the lack of their labor. It's the lack of um, availability of drivers. It's a lack of, of affordability in product, especially at the wholesale level when it comes to proteins, it comes to linens. Um, the commission cap thing seems to be an arbitrary and almost discriminatory attempt to alleviate restaurant suffering from a myriad of issues. And as I sit as the you know, Internet Association's director, we take a global look at things and permanent commission caps are just one aspect. We are fully supportive of laws that would ban ghost kitchens. We're fully supportive of the measures that are also on the agenda today. However, when it comes to price fixing, especially in a business to business contract, that's where we have major concerns. Um, because it does seem like this council is attempting to assist restaurants who fairly are still struggling, um, but to impose a permanent cap now that the emergency order has been lifted, the temporary cap was tied to that. It does seem a bit like government overreach. So I understand where you're coming from, especially as the chair of the Committee on Small Business, but I would encourage the committee to look at other aspects of what is causing restaurants to have to pay so much more to stay open. Thank you for that. Just to counter, you know, in all of those other issues that you mentioned, whether it be rent or regulation or fees or taxation, there's an ability and a time for a business to adapt and change its business model. The pandemic, what should have taken years or perhaps decades to do, happened within months. A complete shutdown. Your only option was to order food through a platform. And where over a duration of time, a restaurant could have adopted and been prepared for those fees that are needed, could have come up with its own platform, could have marketed its own uh, products and services, was stripped away because of pandemic forced closure and the only avenue for them to do any business was predominantly through third-party food delivery apps. That's the, the part of the equation here that we have to keep in mind. I am not supportive of regulation. But those times called for dire action because there were dire times and consequences. These hearings are part of a process. Bills are introduced, legislation is introduced. We present it to the public. We hear from the public. And then ultimately we decide based on those testimonies, what 
if anything, we do. So I want, this, is, this hasn't been dictated or written in stone. And I'm grateful to you for participating and sharing your thoughts with us. But I want you to know, every bit of the testimony you heard today is, set, is taken into consideration to determine what steps are needed next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling on Montana Williams, followed by Spiros Cassinis, and then Sal Ismail. Montana? Your time will begin. Good afternoon, Chair Joe Knight and members of the council. My name is Montana Williams, and I'm the Director of State and Local Public Policy for the Chamber of Progress, a new center-left tech industry coalition promoting technology's progressive future. Our corporate partners include companies like DoorDash, Grubhub, and Uber Eats, but our partners do not have a vote or veto power over our positions. During the pandemic, Governor Andrew Cuomo designated food delivery as an essential service. Third-party delivery companies provided a safe and convenient alternative for families to get their meals. The caps that the council imposed last year may have offered some relief to restaurants in challenging times, but it also made it more expensive for New Yorkers who were trying to support local restaurants safely through delivery. That's because while restaurants were paying lower fees, delivery services still had to pay drivers, conduct background checks, and handle customer inquiries. Families ordering local delivery ended up covering restaurants tabs through higher prices or recovery fees, creating a domino effect. These families started ordering less, leading restaurant sales volumes to decrease four to 7% in some cities. This translated into lost wages for delivery drivers and lost sales tax revenue, which could ultimately mean a New York tax revenue loss of $5 million annually. Though times are notably still tough, local restaurants are now on the path to recovery. New York restaurants have been functioning at full capacity since May 19th, and the federal government is administering $29 billion in grants. Because of this, they are no longer in need of these delivery fee caps. As we emerge from the pandemic, we encourage the city council to leave the delivery fee cap behind. Thank you for your time, and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Um, the number you quoted, $5 million loss in tax base, is that what you said? Yes, loss in tax revenue for, for New York. Due to the pandemic and the forced closure and uh, not allowing New Yorkers to frequent restaurants, is that the, uh, the number that you're referring to? Mm, no, I was more so, like I said, because of the, the delivery caps, that would be kind of an unintended unintended consequence of keeping the fee caps consistent. So Ms. Williams, the argument is in restaurants are entrepreneurs. Yep. They're gonna make adjustments to make a profit, to stay in business. Mm -hmm. Many restaurants didn't offer delivery service mm -hmm. prior to pandemic and they weren't prepared for it. Um, all of their in-house employees obviously had to be, there was no need for bar backs and waiters and waitresses and bus boys. The in-house dining was shut down. They were forced to rely on pickup or delivery only when their businesses were not set up for it. If you heard the testimony that the profit margins are between six and 9% and they're paying fees currently with a cap at 20%. The translation is on every transaction, it's yielding a net loss to that restaurant. That's not good for anyone because when that restaurant shuts down, there is no need for a delivery person. There is no need for a kitchen staff or a cleaning staff or a waiting staff. We need to ensure this industry survives. Mm -hmm. And the measures that were taken were done so to give them time to adapt their business models to this new world. E-commerce is here to stay. Third-party food delivery apps will remain. We just need time for our businesses to adopt and become real partners where they benefit from it as well. And it just can't be passed on to customers. Because when those fees or the venue prices go so high, 
there will be no one ordering and there will be no need for a driver or for a kitchen staff. And that's our concern. But I, I hope you submitted your testimony in writing so that we can refer to it as well. And we'll stay in touch with any follow-up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling Spiros Kasimis, followed by Sal Ismail, and then Carmine Mitroni. Spiros? Your time will begin. I don't believe Spiros is present in the hearing. So next we'll be moving on to Sal Ismail and then Carmine Matroni and then Jonathan Forgosh. Spiros? Your time will begin. Next we'll be calling Sal Ismail, Carmine. Oh, I just, sorry, I, I apologize for repeating myself. Is Sal present at the hearing? Okay, we'll be moving on to Carmine Matroni and then Jonathan Forgosh and then Brian Grobman. Carmine, are you present? Okay, next we'll be moving on to Jonathan Forgosh, Brian Grobman, and then Karina Morote. Is Jonathan present? I am. Okay, please proceed, Jonathan. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. My name is Jonathan Forgosh. I'm the executive director of Queens Together, a nonprofit association of diverse restaurants supporting each other in business and working with communities in crisis. We are uh, located in Queens, New York. By our very nature, our diversity, multiculturality, geography spread makes us ripe for predatory practices by groups such as these here today, the third party delivery apps. And let me start by saying, that the third party delivery and ordering platforms offer valuable services to the restaurant community. Um, without them, we might not have been able to get through the pandemic. But that being said, these services are not being sold to restaurants as a standard business offerings to help their bottom line. Many of the larger third party delivery and ordering platforms are using these services in a predatory manner to dominate the market, control a restaurant's online presence and exploit our restaurant community for profit. How with exorbitant fees, hidden fees, confusing contracts, false websites, and phone numbers. An example of this is over the last year, one of our member restaurants, a small pizzeria in Western Queens, paid a total of $178,000 in fees to third party delivery platforms. That's about 23% of each order. These exorbitant fees leave very little room, if any, for profits. And you, as you heard earlier, standard profit in a restaurant is six to 9%. Um, a lot was said here today, so I'm going to skip ahead to something that I found very important, and that was commentary by Daniel McCarthy. He spoke about the transference of $19 billion from the restaurant industry to these third-party platforms. And it's not just the restaurants. That is transfer of wealth from communities, the restaurant, the customer, and the community itself. So by taking the money out of the community, we are losing much more than perhaps restaurants you know, you're taking money from tax base, from local employees. All these things really need to be discussed. And, you know, Grubhub mentioned earlier that they are a publicly traded company and they need to have their right to profit protected. Wow, I would love the same for our restaurants in New York City. But unfortunately, we can't do that, nor is that democratic. We are here to fight for our business and fight for ourselves that type of protection really shouldn't be allowed. And we applaud the efforts by the city council to pass these bills. We support every bit of it. We need to help our restaurants survive and thrive in today's economy. Thank you for your time. Chairman, I really applaud your comments here today and I welcome your questions. Jonathan, I wanna thank you for being so patient um, and um, your participation in today's hearing. You're fighting for an industry and we welcome it. All of the testimonies will be considered as we decide how we're gonna move forward. And we have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm grateful to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll be calling Brian Grobman, followed by Karina Morote and then Taner Yijiter. Brian? 
Your time will begin. I don't believe Brian is present at the hearing, so we will move on to Karina Morote, followed by Taner Yajitar, and then John Capitanos. Karina? Since Karina is not present, we will next move on to Taner Yajitar, and then John Capitanos, and then Sanjay Patel. Taner? Since Taner is not present, we'll move on to John Capitanos and then Sanjay Patel, and then finally Spiros Kokosis. John, are you present? Okay, next Sanjay Patel and then Spiros Kokosis and then Tom, Tommy Connolly. Sanjay, are you present? Okay, next we have Spiros Kokosis, Tommy Connolly, and then Johnny Marrero. Is Spiros present? Is Tommy Connolly present? Okay, since Spiros and Tommy are not present, we'll move on to the next panelists. We have Johnny Marrero, and then Zoe Darman, and then Avida. Von VG. Is Johnny present? Okay, next, Zoe Darman, are you present at the hearing? Okay, so we, since Zoe is not present, we will move on to Avija Von VG. Avija, are you here? Okay. Next in line, we have Bon Yaji, and then Yutaka Takai, and then Nicholas Hartman. Bon, are you here? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Please proceed. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Bon Yagi. I represent Japanese Restaurant Association. We have about 1,000 Japanese restaurants in, in New York City. And during pandemic, we are a uh, so much hard time, but again, Chairman and the New York City Council Committee, thank you very much for having this opportunity to express myself as the third party delivery charge. Uh, before pandemic, you know, we myself have a restaurant and uh, uh, some of the restaurant, we had a charge by different uh, percentage. One is 20%, one was 25. So we had a, a negotiated with that, but then you made a cap. These cap will be uh, over in uh, August uh, 19. So permanent cap on the third party delivery fee because a temporary cap on third party delivery fee is scheduled to expire 90 days, which is August 19. You know, we like to uh, a possible keep that the number low, be, you know, surviving after COVID to recover, we still need it. And also we have a problem require permission to list the restaurant, you know, the, the this uh, registration will require third party delivery uh, service agreement with the restaurant before listing them their site. So that we need that also. Prohibit the uh, bogus fee for phone calls. Those uh, we have a lot of problem and uh, transparent phone numbers. The third party service sometimes create the second number and you know we lose our own business. Again, uh, the third party and the restaurant, you know, that's like a husband and a wife. Uh, we have to survive. So we need them, but they need us. So we should make some kind of compliment, you know, the some kind of a, a, a conversation and we can come up with their numbers. And Time if a committee expired. can help, it would be very great. But then third, third party, they need to do more work because they don't help us too much because when we have a delivery service and we have a trouble, but you know, they depend on, on us and they don't take care of any phone calls, uh, food, nobody picks up for two hours. Then we have to start making another one fresh 
and, and they still charge the same amount. I know they give some time, okay, the customer, they never pick up, we're gonna pay for you. But again, it's not that, we wanna satisfy customer. So we need to make customer satisfy, we gotta to work together. So please, you know, the committee help us to keep this number very low so we can survive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yagi. You brought something to my attention that I was not aware of. So because you specialize in Japanese restaurants and a lot of the food that you are preparing has to be uh, is temperature controlled. So it sushi. doesn't spoil yes. sushi. You're saying that you can have an order come in and it could be waiting for pickup to the point where it's not tra transportable and you have to redo the order? Yes. And how does the third party food delivery uh, platforms address this issue? You know, they, like I say, they don't uh, answer right away. We have to keep calling like four or five times. And also we have a noodle you know, Japanese noodle, it's like, uh, uh, you have to serve the same thing within a certain time, otherwise it gets very soggy, you know, the faster than uh, pasta. Pasta can stay longer, but a Japanese soba, it takes uh, very, very quick, even ramen noodle. You know, the ramen is in now, it's in New York City. How many ramen shops? You know, they need to pick up right away and the customer have to eat right away. It's not like a, you can deheat again, you know, you can reheat it once, but the, you know you can heat it a long time because that you lose the flavor. So again, the third party they're helping us in certain way. Yeah, very quickly order coming in, but sometimes they don't pick up, and we call them. I say, oh, somebody gonna be on the way. You know, they don't care too much. So that's no good. Again, we gotta work with together. It's like a husband and wife. We wanna help them. They gotta help us. And please give us a little break on the numbers. You know, the restaurant have to survive. Cutting uh, our profit, 20% take out from the, uh, you know, our, our revenue, it's cutting like uh, two, 3% of our profit. To so explain that, please, concern. Mr. Yagi. What is your profit? You said you represent 1,000 Japanese restaurants, correct? No, we, we Japanese restaurants are 1,000 in New York City right now, but uh, our members right now is about 150. We just started uh, our organization. You remember John McCarthy? He's our uh, representative. He's attorney for us, advisor, and he addressed the uh, issue. And, uh, you know, we, again, uh, started the uh, NPO uh, right before the pandemic. What what is what is the profit margins for the food that you sell? Uh, our food cost is especially sushi is uh, very expensive, like a 35, 40, you know. So then you, if you take out the uh, third party delivery, you know, we rather not to do it too much, you know. So that's another problem right there. If you need exactly what's the uh, you know margin on the sushi. We can give you later and uh, what the ramen, you know, the profit or that thing that we can give you later. Thank you, Mr. Yagi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling you Taka Takai, followed by Nicholas Hartman and then Natsumi Yamase. You Taka? It's time we'll begin. <laughs> Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Hello. we can. Hello, Gemma. Yeah, I hear you fine. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity today. Well, the, uh, well I am the uh, same as uh, Mr. Yagi. I am a board member of the Japanese uh, Restaurant Association. Uh, my basic position is the same as Mr. Yagi, and also uh, Mr. Andrew Rich, uh, New York Hospitality Alliance, and John McCarthy of the New York Japanese uh, uh, Restaurant Association as well. Uh, I am a board member. At the same time, I'm running the uh, four restaurant in New York. Of course, yes, we suffered a tremendous loss in the pandemic, first. Second, uh, we need a you know, quick recovery at this moment. And uh, because of the uh, customer's habit changes, 
we have no choice but rely on third party delivery platform. The problem is that the, uh, we do not have any bargaining power to negotiate with those third party uh, giant. So uh, we have to uh, negotiate one by one to, uh, with uh, those uh, delivery platform. But uh, unfortunately, we restaurant, each one is very weak to negotiate. So uh, well, we are uh, insisted a lot of uh, liberty by the uh, delivery uh, platform. For instance, if a customer come up with uh, some uh, crane or uh, some food is not delivered, well, the, uh, without any consultation or authenticity or agreement of the restaurant, they, they just uh, make a refund. And uh, well, the next day we come to know about it. So it is a, a little bit unfair. Sometimes it is not our mistake. And uh, well, you know, the, uh, those type of things, uh, they are insisting a lot of liberty. Uh, that is uh, one of the problem we are facing. That's all. Chairman, thank you for opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Takai. What are the profit margins for your uh, restaurant and the group that you work with? Well, I think the uh, as same as uh, Mr. Yagi, uh, we are this restaurant and uh, the similar numbers is, uh, uh, well, the, uh, the cost of the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the food. So, uh, uh, well, I can't uh, specify the, what, what is the profit margin at this moment, you know, because uh, we are suffering, we are in lead. Of course, yes, but uh, we cannot afford to pay too much delivery fee at this moment. And if we, if the caps are removed and they go back to the fees that you were paying before, what would happen to the restaurant group that you work with? Well, I can't uh, answer to that question, but uh, the, uh, of course, the, uh, I, what I'm concerned is, uh, uh, if the delivery fee is going up further, that is a big problem to us. And uh, eventually that is uh, going to the customers in benefit. So that's what we are afraid of, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Takai. You are welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we'll move on to Nicholas Hartman followed by Natsumi Yamase, and then George Tenedios. Is Nicholas here? Since Nicholas does not appear to be present, we will move on to Natsumi Yamase, followed by George Tenedios, and then Michael Trank. Natsumi? Since Natsumi is not present, I will move on to George Tenadeus and then Michael Trank, followed by Janice Pulicino. George? Since George is not present at the hearing, we will call Michael Trank next and then Janice Pulicino, followed by William Rubin. Michael? Since Michael does not appear to be present, we will call next Janice Pulicino and then William Rubin. Janice? Since Janice does not appear to be present, the next person up will be William Rubin, followed by Taki Wakayama and then David Wang. William? Since William is not present at the hearing, the next up will be Taiki Wakayama and then David Wang and then Jeremy Wallatis. Taiki? Since Taiki is not present, the next panelist will be David Wang followed by Jeremy Wallatis and then Cynthia Shepard. David?
since David is no longer present at the hearing, next up will be Jeremy Wallatis, and then Cynthia Shepherd, and finally Igor Segota. Jeremy? My name is Jeremy, and I own and operate the restaurant group, which has three restaurants in and on the Upper West Side of New York City for about 33 years. Prior to the pandemic, the restaurant business has always been a struggle and a grind to make a living for my family and the team. One of the biggest problems in our business is with all these third-party delivery apps. Many restaurants lose money on a continuous annual basis. A good successful restaurant can make somewhere in the nature of about 10% profit. That's a good one. The delivery apps come in and charge as much as 40, 40 to 50% of the guest's final bill. Uh, it takes money right out of the, our pockets and our team's pockets. The delivery business used to be a profit center. Since then, uh, uh, since the third parties have come in, it's changed the world. And all we do it now is for to promote our businesses and kind of give the guests an amenity and keep ourselves relevant. The restaurant business was a struggle before COVID. We needed to do about 90% of our old volume typically to pay the bills. And now the costs have been driven up by all the different issues and problems caused by the, by, uh, the pandemic. And we need, if we do 100%, we would be lucky that it would be a struggle just to uh, uh, pay our bills. Um, the, uh, and there's a good chance we'll never do 100% again because of the people moving out and all the other related issues. These third party companies come in and change the landscape of, the, of our business uh, and, and they really hurt our team members and ourselves. Many people uh, in, our, in my company of the 33 years have been with me for 20 to 30 years. This is how they make a living. This is how I make a living. I beg of this committee, please cap these fees and give the run business chance and the opportunity to be successful. Um, I just want to mention a couple things that I heard other people say. Um, you know, we wait for delivery drivers to pick up all the time. The, the representatives, um, the representatives, you can't get one on the phone. It takes weeks. They tell you stories like, oh, it's 25% is the minimum for your fee, particularly Grubhub. Delivery problem, uh, if there's a delivery issue that could be caused by them, they charge us. We can never get our money back, even though the customers got the food and, uh, and they uh, charge us for the, uh, the money that was caused by the issues by Grubhub or some of these other people. And they claim that they're their customers. They were our customers before they were theirs. And they came in with these different uh, ways of making a living, very smart for them. And that's, uh, and they've caused us all these issues. I want to thank you, Jeremy, for uh, your testimony and for your patience. I think I heard you say that you need to do 90% 90 90 of your gross sales before you can uh, turn a profit. That would mean you do 10% profit on your margins? That is when things go right. And that was pre-COVID and not all our stores have, uh, have been successful. We've changed concepts and everything else, but we've had three locations for many, many years on the Upper West Side. Oh, and 90% and is typical if things are going well, that's what we need. And now, and we're not doing 100% now of what we used to do and we would need probably more than 100% because the cost of everything has gone up. So if I was to ask you, what are your profit margins? We're not making money. <laughs> well, so you're typically uh, pre-COVID, your profit margins were... Or don't even ask if you ran an average you're for not making... last several years. Jeremy, if you're not making money, why are you using these third-party platforms since they're charging, even with the cap, 20%? Uh, because it, uh, it gives people work. It keeps the wheels turning. It's an amenity to the guests, and it's a promotion. Uh, if we stop delivering, people will forget about who we are. We used to make, we used to make a profit from the delivery, from delivery business a good one it used to be really helpful to our industry since these third-party apps have come in it's changed 
there's almost no money to be made unless you're doing a real big volume. And we do an okay volume, one that many people would be happy with. It's not profitable anymore. I can tell you a quick story. There was a place on the Upper West Side. We, we lost you, Jeremy. The reason he closed, and I didn't even believe him, was because of the delivery apps. We lost you there for a second, Jeremy. Um, I just want to repeat the question, if you don't mind. So you're using, you, when prior to COVID and third party food delivery apps, you had your own delivery people? Sorry guys, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. So you had your own delivery people prior to uh, the third party food delivery apps? We did, and obviously people called up directly to the restaurants, which was which is the biggest issue. Right, and then you just simply just placed the order to go and you had your own staff deliver it. Yes, sir. That's what I needed to hear. Uh, did you submit written testimony, Jeremy? No, I have. I haven't. We'll submit it. If you will, so we can stay in touch with you. Uh, I want to continue our conversation and dialogue. Thank you. I appreciate everything you guys are doing. Survive, Jeremy. Just survive. We will. We're fighters and grinders. It's the restaurant business. Thank you. Next, we'll be calling Cynthia Shepard and then Igor Sagota and then finally Zoe Darman. Cynthia? Your time will begin. Hi, hello. My name is Cynthia. My mom is Maria. We're a business, we, well, we had two restaurants, uh, Corazon de Mexico and uh, La Delita de Woodside. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, we had to close one in Long Island City. And we currently are trying to survive with our uh, the one that we have here now in Queens. Um, we, we are not just, we are a restaurant, but we also assist and provide um, work for women who've been suffering from abuse or is trying to stand up. So most of our target markets are to provide opportunity for them, um, as well as to serve our community. That, that, well, that was one of the things that we did during um, COVID. Due to these um, platforms, um, I was able to at least pay, um, not cover everything, basically surviving, but I was able to pay the employees that were working during, um, during the time of COVID. So it was um, due to the cap that was placed, we were able to at least have a little breathing air um, besides of everything that was going um, around us and it helped us to survive through it. Um, things, as things been opening, um, I got really excited thinking that maybe things are gonna, people are gonna come back to normal like it used to be, people coming in, but it has definitely changed um, our model a lot. Most of our people are still ordering um, through this platform, which our small business um, depend on. Um, we still, struggling i heard that there were grants and stuff given away we were only we were only be were successful to get our first ppp but all the other grants and all that has been offered we haven't been lucky enough as small business to gain in um to have you know to have that breathing air so most of the things that we are making we are depending on these deliveries um uh, catering i'm going out there trying uh, i had to recreate myself selling potteries Next to try to get people inside, bread, bakeries, everything. So I've been trying everything. And then through uh, the platform, we've been able to sell most of this. Time is expired. Cynthia? Hi, yes, Mark. So I, I, I don't know if you finished or you want to wrap it up. Yes, and um, for this reason, I think this should be placed if you really want to help uh, revive this hospitality and really want the future for New York, I think this should be um, this should be a cap place on this platform because then they would take advantage of this uh, this liberty of placing things and we are barely making it through. 
Cynthia, before the pandemic, did you use third party uh, food delivery apps? Yes, I did use um, uh, third delivery apps. It didn't used to be my primary revenue streamline but that we had it and it was a certain potential which contributed to it. But then to the pandemic, it, it became the only thing that we had. Right. And now as we transition and it still has been like, people are still in demand. It, it hasn't changed. It's still, we trying to give it out, but um, there's uh, people, I don't know because of what happened last year was historic, dramatic. And I think this is something that's gonna stay for a while as we try to recover. So Cynthia, when you get an order through a third party food delivery app, are mm -hmm. you breaking even or are you losing money or are you making money on that order? We basically breaking even. What has happened that uh, most of our, most of the delivery, for example, the, the plates, the bags and, all of this uh, has increased tremendously. Also for um, group orders as well. So when it used to be, let's say a tray, now is everything is individually packed because now it's becoming a requirement and these are costs. And instead of things staying stable, things are going up, including the meat, everything is, is ridiculous. And um, I'm happy that I'm, I would like to personally, I, applaud you because you kept us informed doing and you've been fighting for our small businesses and i truly truly um appreciate that because some of not in my community there are many people who like right now i'm able to connect because i'm you know computer savvy but you see my mom and those mom and pop who are struggling and they don't have this ability to represent them i'm representing them today as well because i know the struggle is real over here in our end Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, please submit your information so we can stay in touch with you after this hearing. No problem, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be moving on to Igor Sagota and then finally Zoe Darman. Igor? Since I believe Igor is not present at the hearing, we will move on to our final panelist, Zoe Darman. Zoe? Uh, hi there. Thank you for having me. I actually work with Andreas, who testified earlier, and I fully support everything that he said. I share all of his positions on this. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you so much. We've reached the end of our registered panelists. If we've inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function now or bring it to the attention of a sergeant in city hall chambers. Seeing that there are no further panelists, I will now turn it over to Chair Jonai to offer closing remarks. Chair? Stephanie, I wanna thank you for your hard work and the entire um, team from um, uh, NOAA. And I wanna thank Rachel here and all of you for working so hard on this hearing and the testimony that we heard and those that we could not hear but have submitted uh, their testimonies in writing, we will be following up with you. I wanna thank all of you for your patience and your time and your input. It is extremely important that we hear from stakeholders as we determine how we're going to shape the future. I wanna thank Councilwoman Brooks Powers for uh, sitting in for me and for participating. I am grateful to all. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>